bunch of things. But okay. Yeah, be, please, you know, Alyssa. I would say by being third in line as select board secretary, and <laughs> not present chair and an on Zoom vice chair, I'm going to act in chair for the meeting. So it's 7 p.m. on December 18th. I'm going to call this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board to order. First item of business is to approve the agenda. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Um, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I do want to, uh, I don't know where we, we could probably just do it under next meeting, have a discussion about uh, notifications in, in emergencies. Okay. First one, for example. Um, other additions or adjustments to the agenda? Um, <clears throat> striking the EFUD section at 710. Since our EFUD chair will not be joining us tonight, um, we're replacing that with flood talk. Yeah. Um, Mike, do you think that would make sense to include at that time? Notification? Sure. Do you want to do it as part of that sure. discussion? Sure. We can do it. <laughs> we'll replace it. Great. So we have a motion as amended to approve the agenda, striking the 710 uh, EFED item, replacing that with flood discussion, including conversation of notification for future emergency. Any other discussions? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Right. Agenda is approved. Next up, we have the consent agenda items. There's four items, the minutes of December 4th, 2023, a second class license, tobacco license, and tobacco substitute enforcement for Killing Farms, Inc., 52 North Main Street, a first class and third class restaurant slash bar that was for Stone for Pizza Waterbury, 13 Stone Street, and a sampling event license for Snow Farm Winery, LLC, event locations and barn, 179 Dr. Road. Is there a motion with regards to the consent agenda? I mean, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Make a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda with an amendment to approve the minutes for the emergency meeting for December 9th. I'll second that. Um, do you want to vote on the amendment first? So, all those in favor, yeah. please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any intentions? All right. So, then as amended. All those in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. All right. Consent agenda is approved as amended. Um, next up, we have public. Um, again, for anyone who just arrived, the 710 agenda item has been replaced with flood discussion. So this would be an opportunity to speak to anything else not otherwise on the agenda or related to the flood response. Um, and we would ask that you keep your remarks brief and if needed, we can schedule you on a future agenda for more time. Is there any public comment in the room or online? <laughs> now we'll move on to our updated 710 agenda item, which is discussion of flood response and recovery. Um, if you want to move to the board, I would start with an update from manager Tom Lights, and then we can go from there. Um, sure. Um... Public Works has been uh, driving around all day. I think all the roads that need to be closed are closed. It seems like we're at, we're at peak flood stage now. Um, sounds like there's probably about 15 homes with pretty significant basement flooding. Um, just based on driving down Elmy Randall's Wood Forest, the, the few on Union that, that had it, um, I think there's four on Union that have identified. Um, two are vacant right now. In fact, one of them was in front of you for a buyout a couple weeks ago, and one's in front of you today. Um, so from that perspective, that's good news, I think. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're doing okay. Um, two cars are stalled out in front of Main Street. They drove through the signs, and that happens. Um, but they're both perfectly fine. They've been, uh, they've been taken in and been checked out, and they're all okay in nine hours. So. Uh, no human, no loss of life, nothing like that. Um, Thatcher Brook is going down, Med River is going down. Hopefully, the most PCM starts to go down. 
Um, as some other just general context setting, um, this is currently on the homepage of the municipal website, but I would just note that the winter parking ban is suspended this evening. So anyone who wants to move and park vehicles on higher ground should feel free to do so without that concern. There's also a link again to the previous emergency response resource Google document um, that is being updated in real time. Um, and then I would just add on a personal note, it was certainly an interesting afternoon and that sense of deja vu after five months. Um, so I would just encourage everyone to take care of themselves and reach out if they need support. Um, we do have some systems now in place um, as a result of what has happened. Other folks with updates, Mike. Well, this is just a follow up to what uh, Alyssa just said. If people are looking for places to park their car on higher ground, they may look at the parking lot up by Brookside Elementary, which would be very, very safe to park. Okay. Other updates or general conversation? I would just note there's some road closures. Um, again, linked in that Google Doc, it is evolving. Again, general statement to please not drive through flooded roads. Um, and thanks to Public Works and town staff for being out during the day to day. And they're still out. They're and they're still out. <laughs> the other one. Um, I'll go Chris, then Lisa. Chris? So I had uh, mentioned it, not in jest, but quick comment here earlier. Can yeah. folks online here? I'm sorry, Chris. Chris, you want to come up? Yeah, 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 come on. Sorry. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. Tom kind of jumped on it a little bit about the bridge running down the Brooks, uh, I mentioned it at the last one, whether or not we could have a brief discussion about some form of ordinance or talk about how we can put in some kind of guidelines restricting the amount of debris, uh, at least things like furniture and household crap, um, natural debris like brush and stuff like that is not as harmless or harmful, I guess, is, is uh, human made products. So, if there's something that we can look into at some point, I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Lisa, you were next. Sorry to make you with the laptop. That's absolutely a good question. Um, this would be helpful, especially for people online. Um, as far as the road closures tonight, um, I heard right before the meeting started that South Main Street is closed as well as North Main Street. So I'm just wondering, like, and for people trying to get from point A to point B, is it impossible to get through downtown Waterbury? Um, people would need to use the interstate, essentially. You can, Stowe Street, you can get around the roundabout is still functioning, at least last time I saw it. Um, right, how do you get out of town, though, on the south end of town? I'm not sure where the closure is. Can you, the, can you? The closure is in front of the um, massage therapy. Yeah, so you can, you can get around through Pilgrim Park. Right. Okay. And then I'm seeing in the Google Doc right now, Route 2 Neo Majestic Auto has one over the road, which I don't have a time stamp on it. Let me just say that. I heard the, the same as well. Oh, okay. All right. That, that's good. Just we could still get through downtown Waterbury and exit, get in the, on the, the bridge headed towards more town. Thank you. Uh, Nora uh, Miller is asking. Locals going to know how to go for Pilgrim Park. People outside are probably not. Right. Or even people who just travel through the water area on a regular right. basis, you know, right. to from the valley or wherever may not know the back road. So that's it's just great. Thanks. Uh, Nora? Hey everyone, sorry I should have walked over there because I'm literally next door, but I'm being lazy. Um, we've just, on behalf of the crew, the uh, Resilience for Waterbury group, we've done a bunch of outreach tonight to families that were affected in the last flood and have about 35 individuals we've checked in on. Um, Liz is on the phone too here and Tessa. Um, and it sounds like Route 2 has been pretty hard hit and we'll need some ongoing support. All of those families that were literally just getting their basements and houses back in shape um, and they're feeling a little bit stranded out there. Um, from town, uh, it sounds like Randall and Elm are starting to see water in their basement, but the folks on Batchelder, Healy Court and others are doing okay. Um, so I think we'll keep plugging away at checking in with everyone who's kind of on our list, um, but happy to hear from you all what how we can help and provide updates to you all on, on what we're hearing. Liz, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, 
I, I actually want to go back to the road closures, but I will say just um, tremendous work today, Nora and May McKee and other folks um, checking in on people, Tom Drake. Um, I, I expect that we will find tomorrow that it is a lot more than 15 homes that are affected. There is water, um, you know, in basements on Healy Court and Union Street. Um, you know, I have a text from a fellow earlier who said he has about six inches before the water reaches his first floor on Union Street. So um, in some places, it feels like this might actually be worse. Um, the good thing is most of these basements are empty, but, um, you know, we'll see what happens there. But it is going to be, uh, we'll be putting out a big push for a response. And so, um, you know, I think we're, we're, we probably are going to need to talk about that, right? Like, how do we want to handle the response? Um, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know if anybody mentioned it, school, I believe, has been canceled for tomorrow. Right. Correct. School is close to mine. Right. And um, just the only thing I would say that I am seeing a lot, I'm on the Vermont Roads page on Facebook, a lot of people trying to figure out if they can get to Wastefield from exit 10. I do not think they can. Right. Like I you can get to Main Street, you're going to drive through some standing water. But I don't I don't know what's happening in Duxbury. Right. Once you get past the Route 100, Route 2 intersection and you will be driving through standing water to get there. So I'm, I'm advising people not to try to go to Waitsfield. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to comment to Liz is that I've taken tomorrow off from work and we can sit down figure out a plan together. Uh, and then a second comment <clears throat> was to Lisa, North Main Street is closed, South Main Street is closed. As Lynn said, there's, it's, there's standing water between us and everywhere else. I think if you can stay home, stay home. If you don't need to be on the roads, don't be on the road. I would say thanks to the crew folks, especially for the outreach and follow up um, in terms of next step planning. Is there useful questions or clarification now at this forum, or does it feel like it's a offline conversation tonight or tomorrow or additional public information to share? I think, um, you know, I would, if I have the emergency management question about, you know, the river gauge has gone up a little bit in the past hour, it's not yet started going down. Um, and, you know, uh, most people did self evacuate, um, but I do think we're going to need a plan for, you know, whether it's doing what Moortown did about saying, be ready to evacuate, saying that earlier in the day, um, you know, I'm a little anxious about that. And then um, we're gonna need dehumidifiers, Tom, so get, get back to it, I think is one thing we'll know for sure, right? And a um, lot of lot of sump pumps. Um, since we have to walk in and there was a question about um, notification and evacuation, um, software just doing general flood updates. How's your day been? Anything to share? Uh, not publicly. Um, <laughs> you, know, you can, advise people, but you can't force people. And you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, you, you can't make somebody leave their house. And we're certainly not, the fire department's certainly not gonna get into a uh, forcing situation. It's just, doesn't make sense. I think Nora would ask you to, I guess it's a yeah. question around, I assume you're just continuing to be in contact with relevant folks around yeah, I mean, the advisory was to change. Been in contact with uh, swift water teams, uh, state police. My wife happens to be working tonight, so she's giving me updates as we go. Um, probably 30 minutes ago, this um, state police said it's very close to Cresty, so. But we all know that sometimes that doesn't happen. No, there are people that are still doing incredibly foolish things. Thank you very much. We are we are walk paying attention. We have had people at the station, not right now, but it seems to be going fairly smooth. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have the information on BT alert road closures has been a, a topic of conversation? And I'm just wondering around. 
Um, I know this came up last time around. Is that something you would need to submit as our EMD? Could is there others? What's the, what's the uh, process? That's a good question. Um, all the road closures that emergency management has is our is what we have. So they're getting it. Um, probably through AOT because they've been out and about. And where would one find the emergency? But that's a good question. I don't know. I can treat that well for it, but uh, AO, uh, emergency management has uh, left their emergency operations center because of the flooding and they have gone to their backup. So there's always a challenge in getting accurate information during that transition time. But. Yeah, and I guess we're, you know, hearing concerns from like the public around, can I take exit 10 and get to Waitsfield as a hypothetical we just heard and, you know, we're saying we you have a, a crowdsource Google Doc is one source. Some folks go to the VTLer or the online thing, but I guess I'm wondering if this, you know, oh, a lot of it is knowing how to get around some roads. Heard. Yes, absolutely. And understood. We just discussed Pilgrim Park offline. Not that we're endorsing or saying anything formally. As well, well, but it's, it is a public accessible highway, legal. So unless they put up barriers saying people can't cross those barriers, it is a publicly accessible highway. In order to stop people, they have to put a barrier up. That's not even looking because bridging over. And then unglued, I just got out all the way there and told him when he went down and put more barriers up down on by Napa. Yeah. And down the you know, said one, right. one guy went right up over the sidewalk, right on guy's line, around just yeah. with no big deal around it. So yeah. He said I'm a battery start throwing rocks. No, I'm blaming you know. So I'm hearing there's again efforts ongoing to make sure we're providing the best guidance we can. There are still challenges with Folks implying, and I think maybe an open question with regards to notification and how we can best be communicating with the public in an ongoing way. Again, just to speak for the present, the Google Doc, the town Facebook page are two avenues available right now in addition to the state ones. Other questions, comments, next steps, pertinent public updates. We'll figure out the time. For Karen, we'll figure out the time. Great. Um, and Gary will work on VTLR. Um, I think just to amplify, as was noted, there's going to need to be another response. And so just so that folks know, there are folks who are being impacted. Um, and this is something moving forward. We're going to need to continue to think about supporting both immediate short-term and in long-term recovery. Um, Mike, you had asked about notification in particular? Yep. Uh, this is really not as in response to this event, but the last week event when the select board had an emergency select board meeting. The thing that I would ask, and I think is just good policy that it goes out in two different ways. I happened to, I was in the upper valley and forgot, I left my phone at a friend's house. So I didn't have my phone for, but I was checking emails and thanks Liz Schlegel, I kind of saw her email af afterwards. And I read, oh, they had an emergency select board meeting. And I think it would be just good policy for the select board if they do have something, not to just do text, to do a, a, at least a couple of things, text and email. So, because you, again, you could get email remotely versus text, only if you don't have your phone, you know, you can't, you can't get it. So just point. I spoke to both Tom and, and, and Roger, and then they, and they kind of agreed, you know, it was after, after the fact, I apologize to Roger for, you know, I didn't know about the meeting, the emergency meeting last week. And I would, would have attended it if I if I knew, but it all came via text. My phone was in the upper valley, so it was hard to respond. How would you get an email? How I could get, I could get emails all kinds of ways. But I don't have to get through my phone. I, I usually don't get through my phone. So you have a laptop with you or something? I, yeah, or, or my, my wife's phone. You know, I, I could hook onto my, you know, Gmail from anywhere as long as you have some sort of connectivity. So, so two things, I guess, just to say thanks, Mike, and heard around information sharing. I guess one, just to acknowledge that was the amendment that was made to the consent agenda was approving the minutes from that emergency meeting. For the VLCT training, I'm sure we all took way back when, 
Right. Obviously, that's not a thing we're trying to regularly do at any frequency around holding select board meetings. We had one earlier today, again, because there was an imminent situation that was happening. We then take minutes from oh, them after the fact and go from there. But I think just to say I'm hearing a select board communication piece, but would also acknowledge, obviously, when we can notice the public, we intend to do so in as many ways as possible. And it's when it's in an emergency situation that yep. it's more short term. So thank you, Danny. I missed your hand earlier. I want to make sure I'm getting you. No problem. Um, I just wanted to check in about planning for, you know, what, you know, tomorrow morning or ongoing communication for the affected folks, um, knowing that crew is is already helping and also wanting to broaden the responsibility and curious if outreach to some of the volunteers to the new um, response, disaster response crew and to see if some of those folks are available and might want to come and help or join in and help. I'm not sure if there's going to be a meeting or just ongoing text, but thinking about if it's helpful to pull other folks in and if not, you know, that's okay. But, well, and that might be more of a Liz, I don't know, question. I'm not really sure. Response to them. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, people. Email, um, the members of the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee. Um, but, Seeing as we haven't had our first meeting yet, <laughs> we I can see if I can get them to help us volunteer. But as far as any uh, any leadership or any uh, solutions we may be able to offer, it might be a little nil. No, just just more brains, more brains and more hands. And some people like Danny maybe should be resting and healing instead of <laughs> um, Liz. Did you have anything to add? Um, just that I, we will need more hands for sure, right? There's, I, I mean, Danny, we don't need to recap your, the after action report, um, but there's a lot in there that we need to go do now. You know, like we'll be able to, but, you know, so I think we'll be talking, you know, tomorrow about call for volunteers. We'll have to go do assessments. Um, as I said, we need to, you know, get our hands on a bunch of sump pumps. Um, it, it, this is serious water. It's not just a little bit of water, you know, so we um, have to wait and see, right, about um, how much mud is there. Um, but it's the same situation all over again, right? It just may, what, like, we may not need as many dumpsters or pumping, you know, but I think we're going to need all that. Other comments, updates, things that need to be reviewed now? Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, I would say thank you all. Please stay in touch. Um, it's on the agenda. We will go from there. Um, seeing as events that was impacted, can we just have that agenda item? Um, we would skip to our eight time and it was appointment to the development. Well, just one, one thing we discussed in our afternoon meeting. Has there been any discussion with the church about, you know, housing people? Because I know we talked about it, but probably the school might not be a, a good alternative. And, and, and the question is, do we have any people that will need to be housed over that? I have not heard of anyone for schools on call. We'll go to close for a while. Okay. Um, is the, the church on standby as well? Um, oh, you won't like. I'll, be, I'll, I'll head down the road after this meeting. If anyone needs a place to stay, I'll find in that direction. Um. And just acknowledging there's a chat saying from Nora saying folks are worried but have not yet moved from what I've heard. Um, and I would also just say there is a shelter in there, not that that's convenient to folks, but that if they are able to get themselves there currently, okay. Well, but it is a, a Red Cross operated shelter, so they have facilities and food, right? And that's at the very Civic Auditorium, right? Yeah. Lisa, can you post that in the round of Getting to the various of the go to twenty like the challenge. Not, it's it's not taking for granted that there's the Actually, Yeah, it's just it's just a Any other comments on this? 
Okay. And I would just note we have um, next meeting agenda um, at the end of our agenda. So if it feels that the next meeting needs to be so that we can address it at that point. All right. We'll continue on to lively and exciting appointments to the development review board. Um, we have an email here. Um, we've had at least some resignations from the development review board. Um, and we went ahead and offered um, folks who are currently serving as alternates on the development review board the opportunity to become full members. I have an email from George Lecter, who is an alternate, indicating his interest in becoming a full member, um, which again would be our purview to appoint if there is a motion. I move to appoint George Lester to the to a permanent position on the development review board. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. George is appointed to the development review board. Um, the next appointment we have on the agenda was to the Housing Task Force. Um, as folks may know, Mark Camilio, who was the Economic Development Director at River Lodge Library, has left. Um, his replacement, Owen, who's last name I'm blanking on, um, is here and is, is excited to join the Housing Task Force, but we did know as a formality that, again, that is something we, um, as a select board, appointed the other members, so should also probably just approve that update. Oh. oh, motion by Mike. <laughs> I found his last name. That's all. Thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, Owen set Ducati. Thank you. Yes. Well, that was last week. Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. So, motion and a second to avoid Owen to the housing task force. Any further discussion? Right. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Right. Owen is voted. Thank you, folks. Um, again, just acknowledging that this is quite the transition, but the uh, agenda I have before tonight now is a um, presentation of the full 2024 budget. So I will turn it over to Tom. All right. Okay, Danny's signing off. It's very awesome time and just uh, but the thought was, I'll give you the full presentation and we'll call back departments kind of one by one after the holidays we go through it. Um, still some numbers to change since it's early, but but as of today, um, assuming pretty modest what grand was spread, we're at a uh, 3.9% tax increase, um, about 64 hours for a family at 300,000. Um, the grant list averages 1% a year for the past decade. So using 7 tenths of the time, pretty modest value. Using 1% would get us um, a bit lower, but I feel like it's always going to be modest from that perspective. Um, and then the bottom of the tax rate page, there's that uh, option I outlined about using some of our fund balance now to, to pay off uh, pay off the note that goes away in 2025. So there's just two years left. So that would not be about saving interest, that's just about buying down your rate if you want to do that as an option. Um, and then hitting some of, some of the highlights, um, you go through a slightly different order than the memo I wrote, just to go through some of the departments. Um, on the highway side, there's there's no, um, no huge operational changes proposed. Budget looks a lot different. Um, there's no ARPA funds this year. Last year, there was a bunch of ARPA funds that passed through the highway budget. But, uh, one of the biggest changes is that I'm proposing is that we have a, a young man who's been working for us for the water department, uh, started a summer help, and then we kept him on. And um, they really like him exactly. got his Class C water license, which is pretty tough to do, and he did it pretty quickly. Um, so the budget has uh, funding for him where we essentially agree to a one-third town split, two-thirds EFUD split. And on the town split, which is, you know, roughly 700 hours a year, um, he would do his town work substantially in the summer because we spend so much time and energy um, and money on mowing our cemeteries and ball fields. 
So he'd do some of that work. We'd hopefully save on some contractual fees and hopefully um, have our experienced road crew uh, that does mowing in the summer too, do a little less of that and more road work. Uh, so that's the that's the thought, that's the hope. Um, we feel like he's a, he's a good young man and he's proven himself his best few months. So I on the fire team, I know. I think he was your yeah. junior firefighter of the year a year ago. He was. He's a phenomenal young man. Um, you have so, the opportunity to hire him. So that's part of the proposal. He thought would have to agree to pay uh, two thirds of them long term. Um, a little further down on the on the budget, the expenditure side, lines 41, 42, we are budgeting for pretty substantial increases for vehicle maintenance and equipment maintenance. And that's the um, part of that is the ongoing impact of not having a full time tax which we've had in years past, and we've essentially given up on filling that position because we don't believe we can do it without paying someone, you know, 45, 50 bucks an hour. You mean a diesel tech, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the crew is doing a bunch of their own work. They're doing oil changes, things like that. Um, going a little further down in public works uh, to the second page, um, There's an increase in salt proposed. Um, we're at line 55. Uh, yes, that's correct. That's line 55. Even with our proposal to essentially not salt 10% of our roads, the price per ton is up more than that. So we feel like we need to um, have it extra there. Um, I hope people will move up with it. We can do that. Um, nothing else really major in that department. Um, if we move to the capital side, which is the next page, and we there was an agreement last year to consolidate some of the capital funds. So we used to have three capital funds for highway and then consolidated into one. Um, but in essence, we're um, we're making a bump up on the paving side. We've got $45,000 extra in the budget for pavement. That's about 10%. That's nice to see. Um, Keeping some money in there for sidewalks. Uh, we spent pretty substantial amounts of sidewalks in the past, generally for the Main Street project, but this would be our own sidewalks um, off of that project. Um, generally, some of the bed, uh, some of the sidewalks in worse shape around the school. Not a lot of money, especially if we contract the entire job out, but we hope to do you know, 500 feet a year, that sort of thing, and we keep chipping away at it. Um, a pretty substantial amount in there for bridge improvements. That is for the uh, the state project, the Stowe Street Bridge. Um, so we spent about thirty five thousand dollars on that already. Um, our share of it's one hundred seventy five percent of the three point four million. Um, so we're going to spend, I think, the bulk of that in twenty twenty four and then some in twenty twenty five. Um, but still, a pretty cheap way to, to get a new bridge. Um, there's always a little bit of money in the public works part for building improvement. Um, the doors are an issue. There's always some some minor issues, and it doesn't take a lot to spend twenty grand. We budgeted more this year, just didn't get to a lot of work. Um, the other big change for this year is we are not proposing to buy a truck or a grader or any piece of heavy equipment. We're we're having um we're having a debate about what we want next, and and part of the thinking is is that if we're going to South Barry for material, sand, gravel, crushed stone, um, as is everyone else in our area. Um, we might want to buy a, a tandem dump truck. We have one, we traditionally had one. We might, buy, we might get a second because the tandems can hold 16 yards. Um, we're not convinced of that. It might be cheaper to contract it out. Yeah, that would require a full time driver. Yeah, and we have someone who is essentially almost that already. Um, I expect we will come to you in the spring with a proposal to order a truck contingent on 2025 voter approval. Uh, but if we order a truck in the spring, from what we're hearing now, it's if it's a tandem, it's two years. Um, and in fact, the truck that we ordered uh, this past year, we got delivery of the chassis a few months ago, and just this week we will get so we've had it, we can't use it as no body. Just this week it went out for the body. So that was a truck ordered uh, 
over a year ago now that will finally get in service you know, 15 months later. So that's just the timelines for these things. Um, it's made a little bit worse because the internationals are switching engines. And so when we called international recently for a quote, they couldn't give us one. So couldn't order it, couldn't give you that order now. Call us back in a month or so. Um, so we're, we're simply not ready, and, and our fleet is pretty good and new right now. Do we ever look at, you know, there is a big fleet salary down in Tennessee and in some of the southern states that sell, you know, can, can dumps and things like yeah, that? Yeah, we look at the online auctions. We look at, you know, the military surplus. We, we sort of look everywhere. Uh, right. All that stuff, even all that, the older stuff goes for a real premium these days. There's... It's no such thing as just a cheap well, not, it's it's not a bargain because I know you know we're going down you know it's going to take some some doing and stuff like that but you know I've heard there's some deals that or there used to be a deal. so we had um, to give you an example our we had a Ford F five fifty we sold recently at auction um, it didn't drive uh, we know the deep, we advertise it as is we know the the turbo diesel was shot. So we had a vehicle that didn't drive. Um, that was an older vehicle on its second engine, and we got almost 20 grand for it. They're buying it. Um, but we were hoping to get anything for it, I think, at that point. Um, so I don't see them getting um the, 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 I guess I guess in, in vehicles in general, the, the appreciation standards. The rules have changed dramatically for any type of vehicle, whether it's work or consumer. At least that's what I, I can see in the numbers. Chris, you have a question? Yeah, I want to just back up a little bit about the uh, gravel issue. Um, has the town given up on the quarry? Uh, yeah. Rewind that. Yeah. Do you hit a wall there? Yeah, we hit a wall there. Actually, um, the state just a week or so ago, um, they published a unit management plan for the whole Worcester range. Um, essentially, you make the request to the Department of Forests and Parks. The Department of Forests and Parks is there to protect the state forest. And they're not interested in negotiating. Even if I were to offer, which the town doesn't know, but if I were to offer the waterworks, which is hundreds of acres in exchange for five acres or so, I don't think they'd say yes. Their job is to protect the state forest and then protect what they have. Um, so I think if there's ever going to be access to it, it's a legislative solution, it's not going to go through a state agency. I think I got that message pretty much. Yes, I have a question. Is, you know, somebody just told me that Duxbury just had a uh, meeting the other night about the same topic. Yeah. Uh, impact throughout this entire central Vermont area is. And the grow grow would be a substantial issue. The other yeah. is uh, someone needs to change the rules. Yeah, and the irony is if, if the state were to develop it, they probably could within their own set of rules. Um, but yeah, they're pretty hard now on the issue. Towns completely scrapped from the interview. We need to keep the town maintained. I don't think we can allow it to get to that point. Yeah, I think so. I think so. That's the need for the uh, tan and truck. Perhaps so. <laughs> And I guess I would just say to reiterate, Tom, you have gone and presented to the applicable ANR folks, right, at a previous meeting. So this is a relatively recent development in terms of it not being included in the yeah, plan. I just want to say the town did do due diligence in terms of trying to of move problem, it forward. Part of the problem too is timing. They were when I made the presentation, they were essentially finalizing their management plan, which you're now getting public comment on. It's a 10-year plan. So in the year. 2030 or 2031, it's it's a good time to take up the issue, but it was not a good time in 2022. Well, they don't need, I don't know how to bring that awareness to some of the key legislators. If someone told me how to do it, I would do it. 
they wouldn't even entertain a land swap that is because that seems like they do that kind of thing under Act 250 and stuff like that. You know, have land swaps. So, you know, while even the environmental organizations, you know, have have that, they they give a parcel in exchange for another parcel. I'm I'm probably butchering these rules a little bit, um, but the Department of Forests and Parks would entertain a land swap if it was their initiative, if they needed the land, they wanted the land. Um, otherwise, they're they're pretty reluctant to do it. Um, and you've seen that around the state with, with other entities that sought land swaps. Um, you know, I think the legislative solution would be the appropriate outcome. Yeah, because it, it, I can understand that that was like a critical habitat and, and something like that that they would want to be used. There's nothing all that critical about that space other than it being there. It's critical from the perspective that you have, you have you inter from their perspective, it's critical you interrupt the hiking, you interrupt the, you know, it's in, it's in the heart of the wildlife corridor. There's going to be some disturbance. You don't, you don't blast yeah, it out. Can, so we'll see the wildlife part of that argument. I don't see, you know, the, you know, if it's not that far from, from the hiking trail. What essentially we offered was to go in, clean up the detritus there. Um, the, the pond is not a classified wetland. Or, and they seem to agree. Um, they even talked about that the stream that flows in there, it's not really, it was disturbed in the first place. So maybe as part of it, there could be some, some reclamation work for the stream. And we would leave them in the end, a flat parking lot, which there's overflow now. Right. So we thought that was a pretty good deal. And we said, have extra parking, which should be. And I said, I don't have, you know, I'm talking for the town, not EFUD, but EFUD owns land. And there could be some possibility of the town working with EFOT on the land spot because that was part of it. But in the end, uh, it's simply not high on the priority list. Sure. So, um, the other piece in the capital budget, we talked about it and we, we budgeted it for an excavator last year. Um, and we decided not to make that purchase this year. Now, part of it was. Um, we didn't put as many hours on the, on, on the rental excavator we got this summer. Part of it was due to the flood response, we really couldn't. Uh, so we decided to just keep renting an excavator um, for now. Um, those are, excavators are something we can buy in the lot. They're generally available, um, new and, and used. Um, but we, at this point, we're just hitting the pause button, we're just gonna keep renting. Um, there was money in last year's budget for a gravel road project. That stays in the capital fund, so we don't necessarily need to reappropriate it. You, you could in theory, but it, it doesn't change the bottom line to anything. But it's essentially, some ARPA funds you allocated towards that. Um, didn't get to that this year. That's one of the stories of the flood is, is not that it necessarily cost us a lot of cash. It cost us time and energy, and it cost us the ability to do other things, and, and roads were one of them. So we're hoping to, to make a gravel road project a big priority and do that as soon as we can in the spring. Um, and based on the roads this year, Public Works is leaning towards the bottom of Sweet Road. That might change a little bit and then the winter, uh, but that's their, that's their current thinking. And then perhaps in 2025, we'll have a budget with both block and taxes. And so some of these numbers can change pretty substantially. Um, why? Oh, it doesn't have a line number. Uh, cemetery vehicle is that in reference to the um, the, the little yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 that was purchased this year. And uh, cemetery and parks, right. choose for the grave openings in the park. We're going to use it to help baby a bunch of this free. I guess that's less than a salary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's <in> the, <laughs> uh, the library is next in the packet. Um, in the library, I think we'll have a probably, probably a pretty big conversation with, with Fiona and Rachel and the library board. Um, when and, and I can have detail at a later meeting and we can have names if we need to and go into executive session um, if we need to. But the long and short of it is, when you take as objective as you can a look at library staff and 
and what they do versus some of the town administrative staff. Um, there's about a four dollar an hour differential on that, which is, and you could argue, well, you know, the town administrative staff deal with angry taxpayers and, and you know, people who have angry water and sewer bills, and that's true. Library deals with an awful lot more foot traffic, and to the extent we've had uh, some challenging social issues in town, a lot of those people camp out of the library too. Um, you know, you can slice it and dice it any way you want, but when I look at the jobs, I view them as relatively similar in, in complexity, relatively similar in terms of the public interaction and a lot of other categories. Um, so we sought to try to bring library salaries up to a level pretty consistent with the town salaries. Um, and so that's a big increase. That's a near $30,000 increase in payroll for the library. Um, the other big thing we can't control is, is health benefits. The library's not adding any staff, but a couple people changed and decided to go on our health plan, which they can. And, and you see a near $40,000 increase for that. So effectively, half the library's increase is due to healthcare changes beyond our control. Um, and sometimes that impacts the town in a positive way financially, and sometimes not. Um, I brought forth a proposal to the library board. Um, the library for some years now has given $30,000 from the trust fund, which is essentially skimming the earnings off the top. The library has about a $600,000 trust fund. So um, that's been pretty close to the earnings in recent years. Um, we actually found an old trust fund policy um, from uh, well, geez, I forget what year, but, but 10, 15 years ago, we found a couple versions. They were slightly different. Neither one was signed, but nonetheless, policy is not law. But the policy said essentially what we've been doing, which is take the earnings off the top. Um, policy can be set by the board. Policy can be changed by the board. Um, the board can make exceptions. So I proposed to the library board that as a one-time exception, um, the amount taken from the trust fund should be increased to help pay for these salaries. Um, I thought it was a pretty reasonable proposal, and I think they did too, but they did not agree. Um, part of it is, I think, um, they've got a new treasurer, um, and rightfully so, they want to warn a little more about the funds and safeguard them. And, and part of it is, I think, they're just concerned about precedent um, and going beyond that 5%. Um, the argument I made to the library board, which I'll make a little bit today, is you have trust funds for a few reasons. One reason is you have financial stability. You've got this endowment, if you will, to draw into if you need to. And one other reason that's common is you build a trust fund. If you've got a big goal, you need to build a building, for example. And in fact, the library, the library board agreed some years ago that when this building was built, if they did hit certain fundraising targets, that they would make up for it with the trust fund. That was agreement with the library board and the select board. Um, right now, there was a big there was a big challenge in, in Vermont and the country, and that's labor, and that's finding employees and retaining employees. So I thought, given the trust fund is healthy, given this is our major challenge of the day, tapping into it for an extra 15 grand in one year wasn't unreasonable. Um, one of the questions the library board has was, can you guarantee it's just one year? And I said, I can give you my handshake. I can give you my word. I'm going to make every effort that it's for one year, but a year is a long time. So I can't 100% guarantee it, but I can, I think, 99% <clears throat> guarantee it. And I can guarantee you that from my perspective, I'm going to straighten every nerve to get you back to the 30 in 2025. Um, in the end, they weren't comfortable. Um, where I think the conversation has to happen at some point is the select board cannot tell the library board that you need to withdraw more money from the trust fund. Uh, that's not, to my knowledge, in your legal authority. It's a little bit of a gray area about where the financial boundaries are between the select board and the library board. But it is not a gray area that you can say to the library board that we think your total increase is too high and we are reducing it or we are advising you to reduce it in an intelligent way. Um, so you have the power of the purse in the end. You just don't get to tell them specifically you have to take it from the trust, but you can tell them we are not appropriating $636,000 for the library, some other lower number. 
you could figure it out any way you want. You could lay someone off. You could cut yeah, your purchases. You could do what you yeah, what, what you need to. But ultimately, this is the number that we will approve without basically saying take it from the trust fund and let them make that decision. Yeah, so it's not a closed issue. I think it's it's a dangling participle. Um, I don't think they're close to it. Um, I think it's a bit of a conversation. And part of what they said, which is fair, which is that, hey, if our staff have been underpaid for all these years, why should we kick an extra to fix an inequity that shouldn't be there? And then it's not a bad argument to make. So I think we just need to have a conversation with the library board and, and find some find some resolution. I don't view it as a big conflict. I just think um, at a future meeting, probably the two boards need to meet with, with the town manager and the library director and we'll resolution you know unless as you said they had some sort of overwhelming reason that they need all this money in, in, in their endowment otherwise with, with having that endowment you know the, the taxpayers you know when, when you have this big savings account it's just like all these universities that have these huge huge endowments i don't understand why they don't decrease you know tuition for, for kids you know when they have you know, some of them have a billion dollars, you know, over a billion dollars in endowments. But my my personal opinion. And then I can um I can talk about how we how we were thinking of structuring the pay increases, but that's that's names at some of those some of those more sensitive issues. So I think that's probably better discussed with the library board president. Or yeah. Part of it is um, I'm concerned with the total dollars for pay increases. Um, but I'm also sensitive to how they want to spend that increase and, and how they want to divvy it between the staff. So I didn't want to have a top-down approach there. Would it would it seem worth it to for the select board to sit down with the library board? I think I think a, a separate meeting when we review the library budget. I think we can have that conversation. And it was a really good conversation. It's you know it's not a confrontation with you know, their their job in large part is to guard the trust fund. So. I didn't expect them to to blindly say sure. <laughs> Let's go ahead and, and take a hundred while we're at it. Um, they're doing their job and they're doing it well, and they're they're advocating hard for their staff, which is also their job. I see. Bill has his hand up, and again, just in terms of orientation for Kane's point, I just want to say, like, it is high level review night one, just to orient and that I think Tom's goal is to thank you for our Christmas present of, <laughs> of a full draft budget, um, but that. Part of this is identifying what areas need more follow up. Bill, yeah, do you want to make just for Zoom? Sorry, I think Tom's right. Um, just a little background because you know the library had a metamorphosis here over my tenure. When when I came, the the library that was in this building was a not for profit library. It was not owned by the town. Uh, the town had a library up in the center. Uh, I won't go through all the history of how we put the two together, but uh, the town did it in stages. We took the employees on. Um, we uh, provided additional money, but the library, not for profit, owned the building and uh, they owned the trust. And they were indeed trustees of that lack of trust. Um, long story short, uh, there was an agreement between the town and the library commissioners uh, because the town agreed to go to a bond vote to try to uh, expand the library while it was still not for profit. And the select board agreed to hold the vote, but said, recommended to the voters to turn, turn that down because they said, we shouldn't be bonding for something that we don't own. After that failed, the library and the town got together, and in essence, uh, the library commissioners who were elected and the library trustees who were self-appointed board, they joined to be a super board for a couple of years. They had 11 or 12 members all together, and they narrowed back down to the five, and they are the elected library commissioners, and they are still the trustees of the library trust. However, Unlike when it was a not-for-profit corporation, uh, the the public library trust now is it's a trust. It has to be used for the benefit of the library. But uh, I believe that uh, somebody, a member of the public at town meeting, could make a motion and say, 
I vote that we increase the transfer from the library trust to the to the to the general fund, if you will. Um, I think that I would Can encourage. I, I believe that's true. I don't believe the select board can do it no. on its own. No. A member of the public has to make a motion. Right. Well, the, 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 well select, like, the select board member is a member of the public. I mean, I, I'm not here to tell you you should have a mutiny or have a war. <laughs> I think your idea of sitting down with them and talking to them. But there are members of the library trust, uh, the commissioners, who tend to think that this is really library's money. It's not the town's money. It is clearly the town's money now. I think that um, you know the the uh, conversation. And Tom's exactly right. I mean, the select board can go to the public, tell the library commissioners we're going to recommend a, a tax appropriation of six hundred thousand dollars or whatever the number is, and that can be amended up or down at town meeting as well. I mean, if they think it's not enough, and the library commissioners get up and ask for more, and the voters say. We'll give you 625. That's that's the way it works. But I think that um, you know the the trust has been well managed over time, uh, and taking a little bit more out now, I think is a reasonable thing to do. Um, the a lot has changed in the in the post pandemic years in terms of where salaries have gone. I'm not convinced that the library uh, salaries have been woefully under what they should have been for a long time. Maybe, maybe they are now, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. But I think you can uh, work out something reasonable with that. And, you know, uh, it was a pretty fitful year in the stock market, but the last few months have been pretty good. And they can probably stand a little bit of taking a little bit more Top, but it's a conversation that you should have with them. But I think the library commissioners, if they look around, um, our library, I believe, gets a much higher percentage of its um, of its revenue from the taxpayers than most of the libraries that are around here, especially those that have. Endowments. I think library has done a really good job of supporting the library with tax money. And, you know, Tom's got a budget right now that's a, about a 3% tax increase. And if if you can do that, especially given everything that's happened and is happening out there now with the flood, I mean, that's, that's going to be a major victory. So I think that everybody needs to kind of contribute where they can. And I would encourage you to, you know, work with the commissioners and, and figure it out. But we've done this in the past and there, there have been times where, you know, the, the number has gone up and down. It was 15, it was 18. Um, and the last couple of years it's been 30, but I think it's a, a reasonable request. Well, since you're here and brought up the past, I was struck that on our actual 2020 was like, you know, 14,000 and 2021 was 26,000. Obviously, I was not on the board. We did not have any of the staff currently represented. I don't know if you can speak to that. And yeah, well, like, I think that strikes me as a time there was an increase. You know, the, in my mind, the library trust is getting to the point where you can do what you do with the tax stabilization fund. The tax stabilization fund at the beginning of the year, I don't know what it is now, but it was about a million dollars. And we used to have this complicated formula that, you know, if the stock market had to go up at least 3% before we could take anything out of the fund, and then the next 5% would go to the general fund, and then above 8%, it would be split 60, 40 here and there. We got the tax stabilization fund to a point where we just say, you know, you can take 5% out and, and, um, and whether the stock market goes down 20% or up 15%, if you only take 5% out, there'll be rebounds and you're, you're going to be okay. I think the reason why in those years, Alyssa, especially the one that was 14, my guess would be that the stock market probably didn't perform well that year and, you know, 2020, um, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so it was just, um, you know, 
a little bit of conservative uh, budgeting. You know, let's take out less because the, the value of the portfolio went down. And I don't know all the other parameters, but clearly we, we made the budget work. And in recent years, was there a market increase for some reason? I have this vague recollection that, like, oh, we just recently did a thing where we asked them to contribute more for some reason. But like, that could be entirely. Well, I mean, if we went from fourteen to twenty-six in the last two years, I think we're thirty. But... Yeah, I guess I had some in the end, but yeah. it wasn't. But anyway, yeah. I think it's something that you should uh, definitely talk about with them, and and I think that. The, the public has done a great job of supporting the library with its tax dollars. And yeah, you can't guarantee that you're not going to ask for more money next year, but they need to remember that Joe Smith can make a motion and say, you know, take more out of the trust. And if the public says, okay, that's what happens. Thank you. Thank on to um so, so before you move on okay. can i just ask a question of clarification so not having this having this paper tonight for the first time i had a chance to go through it but on the library revenue store you got looks like you're up 77 almost 78 thousand and most of that's taxes yeah it's all taxes basically yeah and then your expenditures are up around 74 so you're almost at a wash yeah so my question is to ask more from the trust. Can you explain the reason for that? So if we ask for more from the trust, it's going to lower the town tax rate. Absolutely. And that's that's the that's the reason to try to find some balance and and, and in short, if we're if we're asking the town taxpayers to pay roughly 75 grand more for the library, asking the trust to cover a third of a, a fifth of that. Strikes me as reasonable, a reasonable ask on their part. Well, in, in, in terms of revenue, I've been requesting that. I, I didn't put the trust revenue in there because it's not a guarantee. You left it in there because it said, so far we said no. Yeah, right. Right now, you're. you're it's positive 77. Okay. Right. But it's yeah, but, but the very top line is right. taxes. Well, so it's almost so tax tax you raise it, it's up. That would go down. I understand. Right. Yeah. Um, so, one way to think of the library budget is so the very, very first page of this total taxes are up a little over 200,000. They're about a third of that. And every penny, every to get a penny in our tax rate is about 78 grand, 79 grand. So they're, they're almost a penny increase just for the library in one year. So hence I thought of going to the trust for a little bit more, I thought was a, was a reasonable ask. And so this is just another question. So are, are fees off the table? Um, they do charge non-resident fees. I, I forget what a non-resident card costs offhand. I, Twenty-five. Um, I'd like to ask something about that. Go ahead. Uh, let me just finish my thought real quick. Sure. So, um, libraries in general have moved to a model where the non-resident fees tend to be low. Well, they're all parts of broader networks where you can do interlibrary loans. Um, but, but the days of, you know, libraries collecting overdue fines generally found a way to do it, that sort of thing. So I think they could, they could get a little more from non-resident fees, but it, it's, it's mostly a resident lot of it. You know, if it's 25 bucks and we're talking, you know, six grand a year or something like that in fees, but we're hundreds of people, we're not thousands of people. Um, Karen has a question, and then I just want to be mindful that this is a preliminary discussion. It feels like there's more to dig into on this one, but also let Tom get to the full overview. But Karen, go ahead. Well, it was very specific to that topic. I wonder when the last time the library audited their non-residents, because there's a lot of individuals that come into our office believing they're Waterbury residents. They live in Duxbury. They live in Moortown. They live in Bolton. Um, so I wonder, and I don't think that that's, thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars by any means, but I just wondered the last time that list was audited for 
accuracy. I also just think it could be used for the resident folks to come to the library just kind of defeats the whole purpose. No, 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 no library. absolutely. I'm talking about well, I'm talking about non-resident rental fees in the rooms, gotcha. you know, cards in the library. Gotcha. And I'm hearing what's recognizing we're barely a form of the board right now. It sounds like this is a topic we're going to dig more into. So. Well, this is just the question to Tom, though. I mean, I know it's not a lot of money, but the 2023 20, budget from all the increase was $4,763. We've taken in $4,900 and we're only budgeting $1,500 next year. Why not budget $4,700? So there's a, there a proposal okay. to um, have the town of Duxbury pay a fee to the library. Duxbury residents are, Duxbury are treated as residents. So if the town of Duxbury says no, that money just goes back into the other line. Okay. So there's it's, really no net change there. That's for use to pay. Yeah. And then they decided not to pay and go back and uh, pay the, uh, they didn't do a little bit more than that, but that's uh, ended up basically telling the residents that go over to the waterway, pay your amount and, and I and what I've heard is the Duxbury staff are now saying that's more hassle than it's worth. Let's just pay Waterbury and stop dealing with the, the rent. Okay. I didn't see that you were going to increase so, that much. Thanks. thanks. Um, on to planning and community where there's um, there's a lot of action, I think. Um, departments change, thinking change when you have new staff and we've got we've got Neil, who's not quite new, but he's still relatively new. He's in a different role. We have Mike, who's a uh, very different personality wise from, from Steve in a lot of respects. Um, but we've um, we've thought a lot about this budget and thought a lot about the future and reached a few pretty strong conclusions. The first is they spent um, they spent the last six months looking at different software options. Um, and they 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 picked one. Um, they're all they're all more or less for towns our size competitively priced. Um, basically, nineteen five the first year will go down to fifteen or sixteen the second year because there's one high startup cost, and that's related to uh, digitization of some of our existing files. Um, simple way I think of the software is if the select board creates a rental registry, um, people can go online and and join a rental registry not at the come to town hall, but in general, the permitting process would be entirely online. It would also connect to the town lister. So anything in the pipe he would see, he would be able to track it well for grand list purposes, which is an important part of the permitting process. The DRB would have access to it. Um, get them away from the paper, which they want to be. Um, they make tracking easier, make the financial tracking easier. Um, so it's a big goal of theirs. Um, and I think ultimately it would freeze up staff time. Um, the other piece we talked about at some length, um, which is a pretty substantial cost, um, is zoning enforcement, which the DRB wants, and I've heard from the select board in various occasions they want more of. We haven't done that in a major way um, for a while, um, at least to my knowledge. And so, what we've talked about is working with the council, um, not in anticipation of, of higher legal fees going on because we're going to be getting legal battles with people, but um, to in essence write the script and, and help us up front so we're avoiding those legal challenges later on. So part of that is 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 dealing with a few dangling participles where we know there's violations today and how we address those. And part of that is just going forward to making sure we have better enforcement. So we view the legal budget as as a one-time bump, it probably won't go back to the to the ten. It'll probably go back to more like eleven or twelve. But we view it mostly as a one-time bump. Um, and then the other big thing is, and I'll have the detail on this for you um, very soon, all the detail. But we've looked real hard at our fees, um, looking at comparative towns, and we are uh, we're really low on our fees. And so we're going to bring you a proposal, and I'll have that well before your next meeting, probably the end of this week. Um, I hope to be working on that today and finalizing it. Um, 
Our permits now are a set fee. We're going to tie that. Um, it'll be a set fee per square foot. Um, and we're thinking, um, and, and various, there's different types of permits, different components, but, but your base permit for a century construction permit will be per square foot basis. Um, and then we're thinking about proposing um, some reductions for development uh, on this boat water and sewer and, and perhaps a, a nonprofit uh, reduction. But we'll have that for you likely in the next few days um, for future conversation. But in looking at other towns of our size with fees of this structure, looking at our past development, we think $50,000 a year is, is quite reasonable. Um, and we don't think the fees are going to negatively impact um, anything really, given the real estate market, given what's being built, especially in Waterbury Center. Um, and with the reductions for the development where really the planning commission is trying to drive it in our developed downtown. Um, most of the development in our downtown is, is really redevelopment. So that if the fee is on a square foot basis, there's not a, not a lot of square footage added, whether it be a Stanley Wasson, sure. Um, but most of this is, is redevelopment. So the, the square footage is huge. Um, but sometimes the square footage is a Waterbury Center, especially for some of the residential are pretty big. Yeah. Um, so I think it's time, we tr I tried to find, we tried to find um, the last time the fees were updated, and it's not really clear to me. Um, our financial records go back 14, 15 years. And, and in one of those late years, our revenue went from 10, 12 to 25, 30 and kind of stayed at that level. So I, I suspect that's when it was, but I, I didn't find a select board minutes that reflected that. But it's been a, it's been some time. Um, and looking at other towns, what we're going to propose is really comparable to, to other towns of our size. Um, and I think that's a pretty critical part of this process. Um, something I've said to departments is it's not always possible, but if we have new initiatives like software, yeah. we should try to pay for that with non-property tax revenue if we can. Um, so yeah, folks, if you're, if you're building a house in the Waterbury Center and it's a 3,000 square foot house, is there going to be a pretty substantial fee? Yeah, in the context of your 3,000 square foot house, that probably costs a million bucks as a substantial. From that perspective, I'd argue no. But we'll have that before you with some time to consider. Can I, can I ask about some of these special projects? Yeah, those are not in because those are essentially done. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, what we did keep in the budget, and I'm, I'm glad you raised that because I forgot to mention that, is we did bump up the budget for professional services. Yeah. And the rationale behind that is we've used the SE group on the on the, on the bylaws update. Um, and that's generally paid for by a grant that was awarded before my time and we're still finishing that with. Um, but the bylaws are just a part of the a part of the, the town south of 89 and there's the whole rest of the town. PC is working well with staff. Um, they're they're moving along pretty quick and, and I didn't want to end that momentum. So I think some money for the SE group is going to be helpful. And, and what I the best example I put out is the last open house, the uh, the visuals that were put together, I thought made it really easy for a lay person to, to understand the zoning changes. I thought that was worth the money. Um, so part of it is, a big part of it is for the SE group. I think we just want to continue that relationship and keep it going. And then part of the conversation is, what is phase two of the bylaws? Um, I would argue phase two is not the rest of Waterbury because that's too much. I would argue phase two is let's pick Let's pick a chunk, whoever we want to define that. You know, Billy, Billy Vigor, where his dual conservation planning commission had has said, you know, maybe that should be a zoning overlay district for the wildlife corridor, maybe that's phase two, and we start there. Um, which I actually think is a really good idea. Um, but I think we want to give the PC, um, they've got a set schedule, they're going to they're going to have their public meetings soon, they're going to deliver bylaws to you pretty soon. I think after that, given they've been meeting weekly for a long time, I think we should rest, we should reasonably expect them to breathe a little bit, maybe just meet bi-weekly or even take a month off. Um, but they're going to want to get to it, and I think we just want to give them that little bit of professional help. I think it's worked so far. 
Um, I think you could make an argument that that this is new. You should kind of keep that Absolutely. every year because while our fees are low relative to a lot of our surrounding places, our staffing is pretty low comparatively as well. And I think that uh, you know those uh, what you just described in terms of the open house that was definitely worth the money. But I think there's probably plenty of stuff that. For ten to fifteen thousand dollars to pay a consultant to do, we get a lot more done. Yeah. And you know, you've got two staff people who are trying to do all of it. So it's good. The other thing I want to point out on my fees, and I want to say this specifically because Neil, like what tells me to say, it, is that uh, Dana Allen on the planning commission has a mapping background and does a lot of that for the PC that we otherwise um, probably have to pay for. So. We're talking budgets. Dana saves us a lot of cash. Um, a lot of our volunteers do. I just want to say that since we're on this budget. Maybe a stupid question. What the hell is an orphan car? Here? Yeah. Um, so we met with. Um, so we, for some years, I forget the company name, but we've had a we've had a relationship with Michael Shabuel and his company. Who's maintained the roundabouts and all the okay. spaces? Yeah, the guy on um, St. John Kitchen Road. Yeah, we identified this year um, what Karen Nevin called orphan gardens, which are just these these little green spaces that we determine we own that no one's really taken care of, um, and we got some complaints about them. So we wanted to um, just make sure we budget for it and and use my services or someone else's services to maintain that. I know it's gone up, and I just want to know what an orphan is. And then Karen, in her sparse budget, um, took for some other work herself that she really didn't have a whole lot of money for. Right. So we talked about beautification in general and maybe beefing that up a little bit. The other thing we talked about is at, um, at Lefty's funeral, they gave away sunflower seeds to plant in his memory, and so we thought, some of our gardens went with a sunflower theme this year in honor of Lefty, which that was a nice idea. Does, does the garden cost any money, or is that just? Um, I don't know. I've never approached the garden club. Because I know they were always like the, the roundabout. They they used to do always do the planting and stuff. But it's like everything else, you know, things, you know, it's hard to get involved yeah, with. They, they, once the roundabout is built to a roundabout, we do kind of Okay, we have a small thing. They used to, when it, we had the little solid areas down there before, when it was still route 2 and 100 and right. dysfunctional F rated intersection, the garden club did that. But ever since we had the roundabout, we we been, and along with this, uh, Mike does this go out here too late now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think Mike does good work, and I think he's pretty affordable. They did a good job on the. Um, they took away from the rotary, putting up all the uh, garland and decorations. Yeah, very nice. The last one I would just say, since that burn spoke, is I look forward to revisiting the um, both the software and the fees. I'm outwardly opposed to either of them. I think they're both really positive developments. I think we want to just. Especially in planning and zoning, think about like regular Joe homeowner who's trying to build a deck and what that's going to mean for them. So again, for more future conversation, but just want to dig into that. And I would also just know, coming on the heels of our library conversation, if we're moving to all online permitting and that's not a requirement for someone, just noting our library is also where we have public access to the internet. So I don't know if that's going to become a proposal if this is to be adopted. Interesting. Okay. Um, Moving on to REC, we had presented presented back in August. Um, so there's, uh, and that was in the context of hiring, we've now hired. Um, there's essentially no pay, uh, sorry, essentially no real change from what was presented in August. Um, but we've learned some things uh, between now and then um, that I think are worth talking about. Um, first is on the pool. Um, We've learned that a number of pools in Vermont have public swim hours with no lifeguards, and, and the lifeguards are not free. Um, so we thought about that, and we're going to have that conversation with our with our pool manager. And to some extent, I think simple examples: there's a swim team. Um, 
seems a little bit incongruous to me that we we I know this one team pays us for the fee for using the pool, but um, you've got swim instructors, you've got kids in a swim team. It seems a little bit incongruous that we need additional lifeguards there. Um, there's also public swim hours, um, typically after rec closes during the week. Um, and there are pools that have public swim hours without lifeguards. And part of it is a lot of public pools are essentially uh, primarily used by the rec programs and not a whole lot by the public beyond that. And when you look at the number of people that use our pool, and this summer was a terrible example because it was cold and cloudy um, on good days. Um, but you know, we're paying a couple of lifeguards, you know, 18 bucks an hour, and we have people, we have three or four families coming and we're pretty happy. So we're losing a boatload of money, you know, not a lot each day, but it all adds up. And so there are towns that have a swim at your own risk, and the insurance is comfortable with that, and, and maybe we need to get there. Um, to better balance the pool. Um, I also haven't read it because it came in my email today, but Alec has given me a draft of the pool study. Um, so we're we're getting there. Um, and we should have pretty soon of you know some pretty clear recommendations um, about where he thinks we're headed. And I view that as um, you know, I've been saying for a while to staff that I view or perhaps a rec facility as something that you really um, that we're really not ready for. And I, I've said, you know, let's let's give our staff a full year to, to get their feet wet, to be better introduced to the public, and to to grow some of these revenues. And then perhaps twenty twenty five would be the year of planning, and twenty twenty six would be the bond vote. Um, maybe that timeline changes a little bit. Maybe it doesn't. But that's just my my current thinking. Um, but I'm impressed by our staff. Um, the other piece we've talked about a lot um, is the after-school program and looking at what some other towns do that we can do. So some towns, for example, offer um, snow day coverage. Send your kids to our rec facility during snow days. Um, that's a little tough to do sometimes. You don't know when the snow days are. You don't know what demand is for kids. But we've already changed, and we're now taking kids in in-service days because those are planned and that's all revenue with margins, but it's revenue. Um, and so they're working hard on just creative options like that to, to bump up the revenue. Um, and then on the summer side, you know, we're, we're basically a hundred bucks a week for, you know, nearly 50 hours a week of, of our day camp. And I understand that those rates are low because a big part of this is public service. We are childcare for working families and um, and that's important to the community. And we thought, you know, at our cap last year, we had 165 kids there in one day. So that's a big deal if you're, if you're parents and you're trying to make ends meet and having 100 bucks a week is a great deal. And I still think it's going to be a great deal in 2024, but it's not going to be 100 bucks a week because at 100 bucks a week, um, we would lose, really lose a pretty substantial amount of money. You know, that the private market is more like a, more like 50 to 100 bucks a day. Um, so we're still a heck of a bargain if we charge 120 or 125 bucks a week. Um, and so I think that's that's where we're headed. But we're also, I think, now that we've got two, two good time, two, two full time and short staff persons, I think we're working towards, um, you know, better programming and some better outcomes during the summer. So I think I think parents are going to pay more, but I think parents are going to see some value there. Um, and then we're going to work real hard over the next few months on, on recruiting. Um, you know, our rec program is is no different than than the other public rec programs. Not is that you substantially rely on high school kids and, and some college kids, and, and we need some uh, we need some older people in the room. So we're going to work pretty hard at that. And. Tom Gray was someone where as soon as I got to know him through the footwork, I said, hey, you're a teacher, you're off during the summer. Guess what? You're going to work for us this summer. Doesn't that be 40 hours a week? Give me a day a week. <laughs> give, me, give me 15 hours a week. Uh, but someone who, someone like him who's, who's, you know, skilled and experienced working with kids and known to the community, I think helps us out a lot. So I'm hoping I can get a few people like him to, to help the counselors at our camps. Um, so I think we're moving in a positive direction. We've also looked hard at some of the expenses. We've, um, the last few years, done a number of bus trips in the summer, and I spent a lot of time personally talking to parents. 
And they said, you know, our kids just didn't come home, ra- you know, raving about how fun the trips were to state parks. And I said, why? And they said, well, you know, we live near a really nice one and it's a long day for the kids. And the staff said, you know, it's really tough because, you know, we've all got a, a cadre of kids and we're doing head counts all day to make sure we're not losing them. And it's easy in a pool with clear water. It's harder in a murky lake and you're just sort of at wit's end. Um, so I think our strategy is we've got two rec vans that we can take between kids and counselors, you know, 20, 25 people. We'll do trips to state parks all the time, but we'll do small groups and and maybe we'll do one bigger trip to sort of close out the summer. But we've got these vans looking for problems. It'll be a bit more local. You know, it might be the reservoir, it might be hiking, things like that. Um, but we, we really don't love the concept of putting 150 kids on buses and, and it's just a lot of work for the staff. And I can I can see that. Um, the the other piece, um, nothing really changing on the park side. We've got some money in the budget uh, that would be grant matching funds for the low rec grant that we applied for. Um, it'll be some time before we hear about that. Um, Nothing else really hugely changes what we presented in August. Again, I think we're, even if we have a pool number, um, to me, we're not ready um, in the near term for, for any sort of decision by the public because I think we need more time with our staff to, to get familiar with the pool and to, and to run it. And there's, um, I think we want to make sure operationally we work out all the kinks and we're running a really good operation before we ask the taxpayers, presumably for millions of dollars. I want to first be able to say that with a straight face that we're really good at running a pool before we say, hey, let's ask, let's just ask for money and solve the problem that way. Um, it's an old pool. It was really tough to maintain this past summer. There was algae issues that we just couldn't quite deal with. Um, the rain made it a whole lot worse. Um, Kyle Guyette and the water department, to his credit, did a lot of work on the drain, and we think that helped with some of the water loss, but in the end, we have issues mixing water in the shallow end, um, and we still have a ton of water loss, about equal to the, to the volume of the pool. Um, so it's, we lower the water a bit for the winter, um, and it stays there. So it's, it's, in the, it's in the system, in the water exchange system, up high. It's not the drain in the bottom. Um, but in the end, without reading the study, it's a very huge pool. So whether we call it a new pool or build it where it is, it's essentially a new pool. And then I uh, raise a uh, question about <clears throat> with the teenage staffing, the high schoolers staffing, we have summer camps and the pools. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> are we going to be able to compete with what the private sector? Paying teenagers for their labor, we rate we so historically and and what Waterbury has done historically is, from what I found, comparable to every other town in Vermont. You hire a kid at a certain wage, and every year they go up an hour to help keep them. Um, we started kids at sixteen at sixteen bucks an hour, and there. So if you're starting, you know, a sophomore in high school, you're eighteen as a senior. Um. I felt like that was all the competitive. It feels like that one to me. Yeah. Um, at the, 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 the challenge. I wish I was making 60 bucks. To, to, to me, my, my observation was that we, we, need to do, we need to do a better job at the start early of recruiting kids. Um, last summer, everything turned over. It was disjointed. It was tough. We got through it. Um, so a better job recruiting earlier, really work hard on, you know, those those kids that are excelling at school and doing extracurricular activities and, and really are excited about it, but don't just need a job. Um, part of it, too, is, you know, the day starts early and, and ends late. Um, and most high school kids are pretty burnt out at the end of the day, and by the, the last few weeks of the summer, they're really burnt out. And so we need far fewer people working full-time or if they're full time, it's really forty and not fifty. Um, so if we can get a bigger cadre of kids, we can rotate, we can set schedules better, and and, and move kids around a little sure. differently. But yeah, there's a lot of burnout. Um, so I'm not sure the challenge is wages. I think it's actually a pretty tough job, Roger, because the young kids, you know, their energy exceeds ours. 
So you've got to be on all the time. Um, and I think some 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 of our staff um, were worn pretty thin by the end, and, and I was at all. All right. Um, no big changes in the parks in terms of the total budget. Um, Pokemon 100 grand will probably be there, there for a while. Um, and on the capital side, I'm not putting a lot of money into the rec capital side. Um, partly because sometimes you sometimes you over budget on the capital side to save something. But um, if there's a future of a pool replacement, um, which isn't a foregone conclusion, of course, um, an awful lot to happen between now and, and that vote, if there is one for a rec building, those are not small items, those are multi-million bond items. Um, and so I really didn't see the point of saving, you know, 20 grand as a down payment for something that might cost three or four million. Um, if it was something that might cost a hundred grand and we buy it two or three years, I'd say, well, maybe we want to save and make some cash. Uh, but those are pretty big picture items that might be in our future. Um, and the final thing I just want to say about the pool is we haven't just talked about a new pool um, similar to its current form. We've also said, hey, the pool is substantially for the summer rec program and not used all that much by the public, even in its best years. It's used by the public, but not hundreds of people. And part of that, I think, is I think the reservoir is a pretty, pretty decent place to swim, pretty inviting, pretty cheap. So we've said, well, there could be an array of options that's, that we discuss in detail when we're there. And one is replace the pool as it is. One could be a smaller pool that's, that's really just for rec. Still could be public, but smaller pool, save some money. And one is to try to engage with the state and say, hey, um, maybe water area residents come to the reservoir and they show their license and, and they get in for free and you bill us. And maybe that's a reasonable thing to consider. Um, we have, you know, in my judgment, we want to talk about, you know, some, some increased usage so we can do things like swim lessons. And, and I think that's a good public service, but um, we're not just working blindly towards a multi-million dollar new goal. There's, I think, an array of options to talk about. I like that idea. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, oh, I like that idea. Okay, go ahead. Can you explain, and I'll kind of maybe I'm confused in terms of on line 45 where we're at salary. Mm -hmm. Um, I know in 2022 it was 89. That was probably when Nick Nadeau was here, and because of his responsibilities, the position was kind of raised. How have we gotten to? I know last year we budgeted 78, and we we were actually at 66, and that was I think because of the vacancies and stuff like that. But how have we gotten now up to? Could you? Tell what entails the hundred twenty six five. So that's our two full time people. Yeah, that was the good. two so, full time. Yeah. How much each one is? Well, it says the change for last year is forty eight five. Yeah. So the new hire is is almost exactly that. I think. That is okay. So that is exactly so the new hire. Just yeah. And then and then for the summer pay below that, um, the staff are going to spend a substantial amount of time in the summer camps, obviously. Right. But you still need that army of the high schoolers and college kids. That's how I pull up, but I just want to make sure it's it's not a significant increase from what it previously was because yeah. it has increased. And, and, and I know that the new person was at 48. And that's part of the need for the rate increases. And we do something? No, it's just cold. <laughs> it said at 79 for the record, so, but I'm shivering. <laughs> um, moving on to cemetery. It's, it's cemetery is, um, it's been a difficult issue over the past year or two, I think. A um, couple, of, couple of fundamental issues. Um, the road crew and public works, um, you know, various places in the budget, we, we pay other town departments. We, we don't do it in the cemetery, but perhaps we should because the road crew um, does the Maple Street Cemetery. Um, for a long time, we had a company that, that mowed and trimmed Hope Cemetery. I don't know if it was a company, I think it was one person, but he did it 
really cheap. It was, as I recall, 14, something like 14 grand for the year. Um, so he, he retired, um, tried to entice him into doing it and paying him more money, wasn't interested. Um, Woody called every every mowing service in three counties, I think. Uh, and the best we got was um, two grand a week for that you get mowing every week and trimming every other. So that changed things pretty dramatically. Um, Part of our reason to want to hire the person in public works is to take some of that work away uh, from contractors. So we're going to rebid all that this year. We're working hard on a few people um, to see if we can get a better rate. And I thought three or four times I've had someone who would do it pretty substantially cheaper, but it just never quite panned out. Um, so that's a real challenge for we're probably a year away. I'm not, I don't know if I mentioned this at a semi for meeting so like, well, I'm not satisfied with the technology yet, but we're probably a year um, or two away perhaps from looking at robot mowers, which are hugely expensive. But if we're paying two grand per model, that's also hugely expensive. And and my my problem isn't the mower itself. My problem is you know the service contract you need to maintain for the PC that goes with it and the software. And then if you have a robotic mower that's rechargeable, you want power on site because they they were in the route and they can go and redock themselves and recharge just like the little vacuums that you can buy for your house. But I worry about a small mower that you know weighs 150 pounds that's out there doing its thing on its own that costs eighty thousand dollars, and someone can easily pick it up and then what happens? Um, do we do we have a GPS on it and we have duct tape and air and air tag yeah. to it or something? <laughs> Where Riegler goes and traces down the mower thief. Um, it's a, it's a little bit of a scary proposition from that perspective. So there's, Asia. I've got to sort some of that out. Um, well, I mean, you know, there's battle bots. I mean, come on, hammers. Speak. And, you know, maybe one of our staff trims and the mower mows while we're there. I'm not sure, but speak to the company. Our on the website. They have a mower service. Um, okay. In the softest <laughs> possible way, I'm just going to remind folks it's 836. We have a FEMA bio on our agenda. And this is a high level overview. Not that I am not also excited for the saga of the future okay. robot mowers, but I don't see it as a high level point of point. Yes, Kate. Uh, one, I'm worried about the robot mower revolution. And uh, two, um, what do we charge per lot? Oh, I forget all pan. Is it only a couple hundred bucks? Wait, 14. 14 That's the lot I just, I just processed for John recently. It was $1,425. I think it was like fits eight cremations and maybe four casket burials or something, but just to give you a, a sense. And that's that more or less covers our cost. There's public works up in the grave. There's some there's some work that John Woodruff does. He's not entirely free. He's very cheap. I don't have they, any frame of reference for They actually pay eight. extra for the opening, though. Yeah. That does have an additional cost. Right. Bill does have his gimmick. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, the cemeteries have changed a lot over the past for years, especially. I mean, when I first came here, everybody that died got buried in the cemetery. And most of them were full grave burials, and that was, you know, an expense to them. Uh, lots of people don't get go in cemeteries at all anymore. So you're really in a position of, of paying to maintain the cemeteries, what you have. Um, you could you could double the rate for selling a lot and for opening graves and stuff like that, and it's going to be a nominal difference in your budget. Um, so I, I just wanted to to say that. And um, uh, in your in your memo, I'm a little confused because the cemetery fund is its own fund right now, and on your budget you don't show any of the yeah um, i just i put it on the summary page but i didn't put it in interest yeah, and, and gains the fifteen thousand dollars that was sent from the general funds to the cemetery fund was just so it was an easy way to get fifteen thousand dollars of tax money to the cemetery and the, that money was put there because for uh, forever there was the town didn't even realize that it owned the cemeteries because we had two cemetery associations that were running it. And the two associations back starting around 2012 or 13, right after the flood, the Waterbury Center Cemetery, 
turned over hundred thousand dollars to the town and said, We're out of business, we're not doing any of this anymore because most of our members are in the cemetery now. And not here in the, and hold the cemetery like Robert Graves and Ed Brown and it like that. And then just I mean, we had moved into this building when the Hope Cemetery Association dissolved, and they turned over close to four hundred thousand dollars, I think. So there's a substantial um, trust in the cemetery, and the comment that the general fund would have to uh, pay in deficit if you don't take more out of the trust, it's all in one month math. So the, the taxpayers are paying fifteen thousand dollars for the cemetery right now. The rest of it is being paid by the cemetery trust fund. And the last I looked, the trust fund is still increasing in value. So we paid forty thousand dollars or whatever it was this year for for uh, ground statements, and I understand you know that's that's higher, but I don't think it has to impact the taxpayers at all at this point. There's plenty of money in that, that in that trust. That's a conversation with the cemetery. Elected cemetery commissioners because it's a similar issue to the library. Yeah. I view the cemetery trust and the library trust as fundamentally different. And I can see a future where I think the cemetery trust could be drawn down right? because the amount of money we're going to have to spend on cemeteries is going to stay higher. It might level off, but I don't think it's going back to where it was. Um, the library, I think, is, is a little bit different. Um, from the perspective in that we're going to maintain the cemeteries forever. That's our obligation, but nothing really has to change. The library is an ongoing, evolving organization and always will be. So I think having a trust could be useful because who knows what libraries look at in 20 or 30 years will have two libraries, for example. Um, but fundamentally, the cemetery maintenance is going to stay the same. Um, I'm not sure the cemetery commissioners agree that with my theory that, you know, maybe in, in a decade or more that the trust essentially just gets whittled down over the years, but um, doesn't mean we're not meeting our obligation to maintain the cemetery. It's just a matter of how you pay for it. And I think the conversation that has to happen is that the cemetery uh, commissioners are spending a fair amount of money, or at least when I was here, they were spending a fair amount of money on you know, clean stones and things like that. that you know, that's, I think, where the debate needs to happen. But I think right now, the idea back when we went from zero, we first started off with $7,500 going from the general fund to the cemetery fund. It was just to show the taxpayers that that's the town cemetery. It's been $15,000 for quite some time. I noticed you took the fifteen out of the budget this year. Um, I think that's fine. I think there's not... I'm not disagreeing with your assessment. I'm just saying that at the present time, I don't think that there's a big uh, crush going to come down on the fact that it's something that you have to plan for. But you know, you could simply, you know, uh, if the town ended up spending sixty thousand dollars out of the general fund for the cemetery, it's still a pretty nominal, less than one cent on the tax rate. It's four times. What the taxpayers paying right now. So I think you've got some time here. Um, I, um as a question, just yeah. I'll make it quick. Um, say for example, we don't charge the taxpayer a dime for cemetery upkeep. How many years before that trust fund expires? <laughs> About four hundred grand in it now. Um, we spent so one hundred and twenty-seven last year. Yeah, yeah, this this past year they spent a lot. Part of it was um, the mowing. Part of it was they had a donation from a few years ago that they essentially earmarked Got to it. spend some money on it this year. And that's the big part of it. It's not just the mowing and trimming. It's it's it's, it's the monuments and to what standard you maintain them all. And there's some specialized cleaning that goes with that. Yeah, they just um, built a nice sign up on the Maple Street Cemetery. That must have cost a little bit of money. So to some extent, it's a matter of I think just managing those expectations. Right. Mike and then Chris, but and again, I'm not trying to be cranky at folks or not encourage the discussing. I just want to be aware of. I'll be yeah. real, real quick. I really think a lot of the cemetery expenses shouldn't come at the expense of the taxpayers. 
you know, throughout New England, you know, when people buy graves and perpetual care agreements that are the perpetual care agreements for like the cost of our grave is probably one year of their the cost for them for their perpetual care agreement. And I don't I'm, I don't see why we can't charge people who are going to bury their loved ones. You know, some sort of it's it's a cost of you know you know care. And I think most people will be glad to make sure that they're the you know the, the cemetery was being kept up. The cost of the lot now is significantly higher than the cost of the lot was in the perpetual care. People did buy perpetual care right. here, and the two associations went out of business and turned all that money over to the, to the town, and that's what that four hundred thousand dollars, where most of that came from. So you know you can adjust your rates, but like I said before, the number of people buying graves. Um, the percentage of people who die, 100% of the people die, but the percentage <laughs> of people that actually go into the cemetery yeah. is much, much smaller now. And they're not buying lots for even cremations. You know, they're, right. they're, you know, they're burying people in their backyard, they're scattering their ashes at the beach. So Tom's right. I mean, the money that's going to come from selling lots and charging perpetual care is my. And respect, but I think we have that point. Chris, do you have a hand up? No, I just wanted to kind of piggyback back. Kane's question with a rule of 400,000 in there now that are estimated speculative costs of 60,000 a year, seven years, that's gone if there's no additional revenue to come back in. What, what estimated or proposed revenue is coming into that? That's that's the issue. A year now. That's the issue. The only revenue that can go in is things like lot sales or, or taxpayer money. So is there an average? Ten thousand? Yeah, about, about ten. It's pretty low. So in seven, eight years, that's history. No. So <clears throat> on the fire, uh, can I just make a quick observation? As a, as a person, the, the fire department sets up tents at the cemeteries on a regular basis. Works out well for the funeral home, works out well for the association. Mm -hmm. But the cemetery up in Waterbury Center, the last couple summers has been a disgrace as far as the way it's been taken care of. Um, weed whackers destroying stuff, uh, grass all over the stones, dig holes from lawnmowers. So I just think if we're going to obviously continue down this road, but there ought to be somebody that's overseeing the people. <laughs> that are mowing it and go over there and say, take your time, do this right. That's all. It's it's a shame when somebody goes up there and their stones are covered with grass and mud and stuff like that. That's it. <laughs> um, on the fire, um, the, the revenue for Duck Ferry um, is based on kind of a long-standing contract that changes every year based on fire department costs. Um, no real major changes in fire at all. Pretty pretty flat numbers. Some some payroll increases. We were over budget on payroll this year, but remember there was flood response, and so much of that comes back from FEMA. Um, we've got a good, pretty good cadre of volunteers. So you, know, you want to you want to keep the volunteers. So you want to you want to budget for that. Um, the dispatching cost is up. There's a there's an agreement, um, long term agreement there um, with Capital West. They did a presentation last year um, about that, but they're making some capital investments, and that's the biggest reason for the increase. Um, and then don't and then public safety side, WASI pays for a portion of our substantial portion of our dispatching costs. Mm -hmm. So in essence, that's the credit on their bill. Um, Wait, they can pay for our dispatching costs, but we, we subsidize them. We pay for dispatching in full. WASI charges us a per capita fee. Gotcha. We get a credit on the bill for their share of dispatching that we do. Got it. Okay. Um, no other huge items. There's some money in the on the capital side for some work in the department for some water lines, and we have some capital mm -hmm. reserves, so we can we can dig into those reserves. Um, so the fire budget is up, you know, 
three, four percent, pretty reasonable place for it to be. Um, pretty well functioning department. Um, on the on the new equipment side, that eighty seven five is pretty consistent with last year. If you want to have a detailed conversation with Gary, he's got his laundry list of the items, and they try to keep up with that each year. One thing I'll say about about equipment and and fire departments, and I've I've made this up. I was told this when I was a rookie in government over a few decades ago, and I've I've really learned it. And that's when you have volunteers, you have to have good equipment. You're not paying them. They view the equipment to a large extent as as how much you value what they do for you. Um, so it it does it does help a little bit to to have pretty good equipment budgets. If if you have someone who you're paying on a full time basis giving benefits. You know, if, if they've got to drive that that plow truck an extra year, yeah. they're okay. They're getting paid. Um, it matters a little more to the volunteer services. I think if you don't do that, you tend to lose volunteers. Sure. Um, moving on to the to the general government and public safety, where where a bunch of the question is, um, we have nothing budgeted to capitalize so enough because we're getting a truck this year, and that would not be the case in other. So there's a there's some money in the debt. For that truck, yeah, um, but that would go before the voters in March. Um, That's in the debt principle. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that would be so about. Well, I assumed about half of that new truck would be in there. I assumed a twenty-year borrowing period for that, so it's about twenty-six grand a year if we borrow for twenty years. Um, so twenty twenty-five would see would see the full impact, but about half of it is here. I wouldn't anticipate issuing the bond until twenty twenty-five, but we have some short-term debt. And this is only authorized the purchase for quite a while. You, you authorize the purchase pending voter approval. So yeah. that would be on the warning. <laughs> then on to, on to general government and public safety, and there's much of the much of the revenues are here. <laughs> um try to be try to be pretty conservative on the on the tax interest penalty numbers. Um, I suspect our, our interest in penalty is going to creep up even more since much of that is the school taxes. And if the school increase of 18 or so percent comes to fruition, which I think we all hope it doesn't, but I, I can imagine we're going to see the impact and we're going to collect more interest in penalties um, because people are going to struggle to pay that, that bigger increase. Um, no real changes in in current use um, as far as the parks revenue, the amounts we get reimbursed for by the, not reimbursed for, we get paid by the state. Um, current use is, is essentially a reimbursement for our lost tax revenue for that program. Forest and parks is more or less a set fee for state land and waterbury. Um, what is the railroad tax? That is a tiny amount that comes in each year. Um, I gotta get you the details on that one. I used oh, to know already well. Details on that one. But I, I don't recall them exactly. Because but what I, I know like to increase railroad tax. <laughs> what I know is <laughs> we have no ability to increase <laughs> this. The state sends us the cash <laughs> once again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think um avoid dream. On the court's fees, um, we're on pace to collect a little over sixty thousand this year. There's a lot of pieces that go in the court fees, but a big part of it is tied to the real estate market. And part of it is prices are high, but there's no inventory, there's few sales, and no one's refinancing because interest rates are high. So I think having 2024 a little lower than 2023 is probably pretty safe. Um, the money from the historical society is tied to staff wages. The town makes a small appropriation to the society, but last year that revenue went up because they have someone who's half time. So the budget assumes that continues, but if it doesn't, the revenue goes down, but the expense goes down correspondingly. Right. Um, the money in debt service, the interest in sweep on CDs is just interest rates are higher, we're earning more, and the tax stabilization is just taking that, that cut off the top. Um, and then where did I miss it? There's the piece on, um, the pilot revenue, yes, it's up at um, higher up. That's the four hundred twenty thousand. So we collected four hundred thousand this year, and that that revenue source is funded through the local option tax from other towns. Um, that's the state, the, the chunk the state collects and puts into the pilot pot. So um, it's based on the insurance values of state buildings in your town. So the 
the twenty thousand dollar increase is based on just the town of Stowe alone and their additional local option tax that they enacted this past year and, and what we've seen from their revenues. So I think when I when I presented our numbers that our pilot our pilot payment would go up about fifteen thousand. So that's from the study, but there's some other towns that are getting there too. So we might well see a pilot of, we might well see a pilot payment of three half million dollars in a couple of years. Uh, that's great. Um, question about animal control income. We have none for 2022 or 2023, but 2021 was $6. Um, <laughs> I'll dig into that one. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. It may it's just be a little available. A little misposting or something, but yeah, it's yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I can't even <laughs> um, going down to, to the expense side, um, move a little bit of the pay around because in past years the the court was in within our own line, but the assisting court was in the regular pay line. We just started well being in the court line. Let's let's put it all in the honor of courts in the course. Um, but on a net basis, there's really no no real change year to year. We had some transition costs in the last year, so essentially, staff even staff the four percent I budget across the board makes up for that. Um, and then throwing in, um, I put in ten thousand dollars for Tom Drake and his continued work, um, or if it's not Tom, um, some other person in the room. Some other that's, that's, the, that's the second line, natural disaster that's coordinator. Um. Going down um, about a third of the way down the page, it's a small item. I did not get payroll system in place this year. Really hope to do that. Um, all the quotes I got were not something I thought uh, gave us a good value. There's a couple other systems I found that um, some towns around us use and still researching, but that $3,500 I think would still cover the cost based on the other systems I'm researching. The, the initial systems I wanted were. Um, they were sort of all in one systems and we didn't need all the features, but um, I had presumed and thought from initial conversations, they would sell us a system a la carte and we could choose which options we wanted, um, but they really wouldn't. They really wanted to, you were sort of a client or you weren't, and I didn't want to spend $15,000 on, on a system. Um, I want the time clocks, which I think gives us some accountability. Can you get some advice from League of Cities and Towns? I know, I know it's a town oh, there, there were a whole bunch of those kind of things. And, and they were the ones that were 15 or 20 grand. So oh, that's okay. some, some more affordable ones. That's what got boots. Yeah, there's a there's a nice one the town of Wonderful uses that I think is gonna fit the budget and, and I spoke to a couple of them, but they were like full service suites. Yeah. I don't quite want that. <laughs> um Nothing else really, really huge in this budget. Um, down near the bottom, the senior citizens did not request an increase. Um, so, so is that for the senior center? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we could we can have them here to have a budget conversation. But if there's no increase, maybe we don't need to do that this year. Um, I think it's pretty good value for what we're giving them. Um, Yes. There's a rate increase on the time, but not other departments, or is that enough? That's across the board. Like it? It's across the board. Okay. Um, and then going down further on the second page, um, the funding we gave for revitalizing water there in five years was partly here and partly in funding development. I just consolidated it in one place. Um, and then there's some big changes on the ARPA side, but there's no proposal to, to use ARPA funds here. Um, there's big numbers on the public safety side, um, really big numbers here that, that impact a lot. Um, so the first is, let me get into WASI first. Um, so looking at WASI's budget, um, they've been pretty good at, at um, searching for revenues. They're doing the vaccine clinics and that gets them some extra revenue. Um, but in essence, if WASI were to break even, their per capita fee and it's water variant and portions of our neighborhood town, their per capita fee would be about 50 bucks per person. Uh, they were 26 this year. Um, so that's an awful big jump. We're, you know, we're talking about $125,000 for water variant one year to get there. Um, it's not about the new building, it's about operations. And it's, 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 the, it's an issue I've been hearing about rolling wood services for 10, 15 years. Um, 
it's not simple way to say it is it's not their fault. They are substantially tied to insurance reimbursement rates and that's Medicaid and that's Medicare and those rates have gone up way below the way below the rate of inflation. Most years they don't move at all. Um, so it's the state and federal government not paying a nickel more in those years for the service. And that just has to come from somewhere. Um, we see it on the health insurance side because hospitals need to get the revenue from somewhere and they make it up and the private pay people like us. WASI has to make it up from us too. Um, so we talked about where we can get them to be on a sustainable path. Um, so the number I proposed is 35, which is a, it's a big increase in one year. Um, we do still get a credit because they're using our building and that's about $20,000. And then the dispatch credit, and the dispatch credit is more or less a fixed percentage. Um, the building credit will go away at some point. Um, they're, they're in front of the DRB now for the new building. I think from the financial side, they're really close, if not there. So um, probably um, 2025, that budget won't have the building credit, won't have the full credit. So we'll see a pretty substantial increase then plus the rate. So this is really one year, um, but it's probably similar increases the next couple of years to get them on a sustainable path. Um, if they're looking at some other towns and can they can they compete for business in other towns and that's potentially a viable option for them. Um, well, they're, they're, yeah. That would certainly, that would certainly help. Yeah. Um, and the building downtown um, helps attract and retain staff that's going to help on the revenue side too. So it's an evolving world, but I think fundamentally, um, rural ambulance services, what we're going through with ours is not at all unique. Um, they're, they're, they're just butting up against this financial law, the reimbursement, not keeping pace with expenses for a long, long time. And, and WASI, whether it was, you know, for years, it was probably to their credit. They didn't ask the town for increases for a long time. Um, you know, so if you look back over you know, the, the long term, this is almost inflationary. We're just getting it all at once. So I don't think uh, they asked the town for anything before for, 2018. For a long time, yeah. yeah. So, Tom, can I just uh, clarify? Did you say what you're going from 26 per capita to 35? 35, yeah. And 50 is the first percent. About 50 would be the break even point this year. At this point in time. Yeah. So, there's still a row that would be higher. Yeah. yeah. And then on the state police side, I'm in talks with them. We're not at a final number, but the, the, the contract is it expiring in June 30th. It's a three year contract, and it's been through for three years. The number's been almost entirely flat. We should logically expect some form of increase there. How much is, is anyone's guess? I think to some extent, how much of an increase they ask for shows us how much they value it, and, and it's a little bit of a unique contract. So I'm hoping they don't ask for a ton, but. Their cost has not been flat for three years. <laughs> Cheaper than our own police department. Uh, How much did our police department cost per year? The village police department yeah. is in the high back in uh, around 2009, it's $165. When, it, when they had two offices at the end, it, the village is paying about what the town gotcha. yeah, and and a whole lot less than it is. Even a small PD would be seven figures. Small yeah. police yeah. departments don't make any sense. Um, but yeah, those are those are pretty eye popping numbers, and I hope. Certainly by town meeting day, but I hope in the next month we'll have some some more certainty on the state police number and that can come down. But I think it's a I built in a hefty increase to hopefully not come back to you in, in a month and say, well, the tax rate estimate was pretty low. Uh, but again, that, that expires June 30th. They bill us quarterly, so we're really just paying for half a year. Gotcha. Um, so I think it's I think it's reasonable. Um this, the municipal building operating fund. Um Nothing really huge there. Um, the building keeps woody up at night because the heating system, as we see, is squirrely. Um, it's you know ninety in places and fifty in others, and and the next day it changes. You now I didn't have heat for a week, and 
And now I have heat, but when it's on, it, it, it's sort of max blast, nothing else. So I turn it on and then I turn it off. And then I and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it, Woody, because he's he's got enough going on, but it's it's typically really cold over here and really hot over there. Summer seems to be fine. Um I have a question about uh, uh municipal building operating fund all the way down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Why is our debt interest rate? almost 50% of our principal. It's a long-term bond. Got it. So that's just the, the way the math is. Um, and then health and social service on the last page, there's there's very little to talk about. We have, we have the health officers in the room. We're thankful for that uh, exorbitant price we pay, but we're thankful for the service. <laughs> um, the community service officer is, is really, um, I think of as the animal control officer. We had one for a little while. We haven't had luck finding one. Um, if if we get lucky and, and find some do that role and we go over budget, that's great. But it's it's a tough job to find and fill. That's the case everywhere. So um, are, are we paying the same for an animal control officer that we'd be paying for our health officer? No, no, the health officer is practically free. The animal control officer it was um i forget the hourly rate but um kind of manager historically <laughs> but it's only when called right it's only when called yeah yeah so we were paying we were paying an hourly rate for for work um and then if you had to respond in person with your vehicle a little bit higher rate um it's just the struggle to find anyone to do it and it's, it's a pretty thankless job yeah so as it comes in, I try to field the calls as best I can. Unfortunately, there's been nothing major for some time. Just a, a small camera gets a bunch of them too, but it's, it's, it's generally been uh, sort of nuisance calls that I've gotten at least. Yeah. And so I keep my cell phone on the website for the after hours things that come in on occasion. But usually it's, I found a dog, I lost a dog. My neighbor's dog was driving me crazy uh, kind of things. It hasn't been a lot of vicious dog incidents. That is a payment every year to um, to um, Washington County Mental Health. Yeah. What one is it? The, the bottom one. one. Public Health at thirteen five. So there's three thousand five hundred dollars for staying in the. So. <laughs> and then just one thing I want to point out. It's not in here. I don't want to go. To, I don't want to go over it in detail. And I think this has been the case historically, but um, all the small items on the warning, which is 35-ish thousand, um, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, but you chase them down mm -hmm. to pay them at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So I'm not suggesting they're not worthy causes. I'm just suggesting that if, if our money was meaningful, maybe they would call for it. And the fact that it's you know late December and Karen is feverishly working the phone saying, hey, you wrote us a letter for a thousand bucks. We agree. We need you to get need an invoice. Give us an invoice so we can pay it. And it's a challenge. I'm just suggesting that maybe that's something to think about. Um, it's not the case with the senior center, they're different. No, it's not yeah, the case with RW, they're different. But to get to closer to a zero increase, zero or one percent increase. How substantially we have to get So I had that option on the first page where if you spend right. some money now, if you're you know call it fund balance reserves, right. call it our part of it. Right. You know, that lowers you almost that lowers you 2.7. Um, you know, the official measure of inflation, the CPI for the Northeast the past year is about four percent. Um, so we're we're beating that. I would argue if you can bring your budgets at, I would argue that bringing budgets well below inflation is a worthy goal, but it's probably not realistic for the long term. But if you can bring your budgets consistently at or below inflation, you're going to do something over the long term. You know, if you're if you're one point below inflation for a decade, you've done something meaningful, I think. Um, how do you how do you reduce it? Uh, well, yeah, you kill zoning enforcement, you kill the software. There's thirty grand. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> There's some hard cuts to make to, to get. If you wanted a zero, it's, it's 200 grand. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping with the state police contract, we can find some money there and get it lower. But 200 grand is, is not possible with our current headcount. Plain and simple. Um, the only reason I get concerned with the expected, you know, 18 to 20 percent increase in property taxes on the state level for education, you know, people are going to take hard. So I agree with you, but at the same time, I know it's just it, it, you're damned if you do. Do, do we do we make the town less effective and less efficient because of an organization we don't control? Right. It's I'm not sure we need to go backwards for. For, to give them space to go forward, I think that's that's their problem. Um, I'm not insensitive to it, and and you know that's a statewide rate, so we're all going to pay it. But but at the same time, I just really feel like if we can be reasonable year in and year out and avoid those things, that's the goal. Um, but I, I feel like if the state's going to be above inflation and we want to try to get to zero, we're never going to get anything at zero. I just know in the end, and maybe because in the last. Three four years we've tried to be as close to a zero based budget as we, as we could. We've gotten pretty close, but there are we do have some challenges. Mm -hmm. So right now you've got all in one and a half cents increase. Um, using the one hundred eight to reduce, you know that's that's right on track for what it's been for right. like the last ten years at the Palms Point. Right. Uh, I always used to say that. Problems with the town, we always had to become a sacrificial lamb to try to keep, you know, cut cut their own necks so that the you know, highway or the uh, education fund can continue to run rampant. And you know, you said it's their problem. It's not their the entire problem. It's just we're not getting involved. Herman, uh, friend of mine, went to the Cross Road. Informational meeting the other night, and I was out of town. I couldn't be there. I texted him that I wanted to be there. I said, How many people there? 25. It was the biggest turnout of all. But they had so yeah. no, what I'm saying is 25. Yeah. You know, uh, and I keep wondering to myself what it's going to take for people. How, how far into the corner do they have to get pushed before they finally start to react? Uh, because I'm sitting here listening to this and I'm thinking about all the things you're talking about, you know, to change this here for maybe and a half to try to get down to nothing to yeah. offset that, you know, it's, it's eventually going to blow up in our face. But to continue to absorb even this penny and a half and then whatever the state legislative body is doing and then the budgets for all these other things. No, I'm thinking to myself, how much longer am I going to be able to stay here? Even doing what I do, I mean, I'm looking for this chairman. So my revenues are going to start to drop. Yeah, I don't have to get on the bandwagon of all these state programs, which I don't want to do, because uh, that just impacts everybody. But yeah, it's kudos for what you guys are doing. Uh, you're right on target. And, you know, uh, Roger Pratt was up in the house the day, spent some time with him. And when he was talking, I asked him what the budget increase was going to be, and he thought it was around three cents or something like that. So, well, that's the biggest it's been in 10 years. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm curious to know what's driving that, but I'm staggered to hear a penny and a half. And my, the other thing is, you know, with all everything happens the way I think we all hope it happens, the 2025 budget will be dramatically different because there's going to be a local option tax revenue source. Um, and that's going to be a, a big slug of cash. Yeah. Um, so there, on that note, and I was just talking to the owner of Bill Mold today, Raylan, about that. I could have swore, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the original conversation with about the local options tax was specifically for rooms and meals, alcohol, and W cigarettes. It's everything. It's all. And then I heard it's everything, and I'm saying WTF. No, well, why that all of a sudden come out of the woodwork? Is there is there discussion to change that, or is that that's what was passed by the voters? 
all in. 267 people decided that. But if it was you think for something as important as a charter, you would have gotten a lot more response than 267. We're in a right. new country. So people are just a lot of people here. Last one, I'm not the current exemptions apply. That's for Pardon? But the current exemptions apply. Well, like, you know, yeah. all, if things that are currently passed, it's like with the main, like even the lower call option tax. And I guess I would just say the last note is we quoted the one and a half cents, um, which is based on Tom's budgeting and the utilizing the fund balance. And I guess just personally, I would say I'm not opposed to using the fund balance, but I do have some potential questions or reservations. So just to at least, and I'd like to revisit that conversation. Um, again, I think I can be brought on board as to why it's a good idea. But I think, again, there's all these. You do it once, and then when it's not there, um, what happens? Well, the reason I wrote it that way is you're you're not using it for an ongoing expense. You're just killing debt. Yeah. And so that debt's gone from the budget. Right. And we have the ARPA funding to do that, but then we get into a very circular conversation about that, or the formerly ARPA now undesignated yeah. unbalanced funding. But I digress. Any other budget notes or information you need to ask Tom in uh, terms of next steps? I guess the only information to think about is we, I presented a, a draft schedule um, based on the, the initial overview. Do you want to email and talk about this? Do you want to change that? You know, do you want to focus on different things? Um, I, you know, I'm of the opinion, for example, you know, if if the senior center is not asking for an increase, you probably don't need a meeting with the senior center. Um, Revitalizing Waterbury is they're asking for a very minor increase, as I recall. Um, I'm not sure we need a separate meeting with, with RWA um, over a you know, less inflationary increase. So I see we have a draft um, agenda last on our list, so we can maybe look at that again and then work through the one for January. Um, so that would bring us to FEMA buyout documents. Yeah. Yes, tonight. Um, Thank you for this the excellent good first stab on here, here. Oh, 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 oh. and I, I meant to print the very oh, user friendly. I meant to print the full array array of documents, but these were the standard set we had last time, just different property. And I can print the full array, but I was I don't think. the applicant, I think. <laughs> but the standard set of documents, this is um 40 union, the one before you was 36. Mm -hmm. There's a house that splits up those two houses because it's not applying for a FEMA buyout. Not as yet, no. Um, I spoke to him this morning. I asked if uh, he's doing okay. He said there's no water in his basement. Yeah, it's probably changed now. It was not leaving. But I would think that that probably changed yep, in the last few hours. That means every evening. Gates. Gates. Wait, is it 38 or is it 42? The last one was about 42 to 40. Well, well if you're talking about the blue one in the yeah. middle of the two, yeah. then that's Gates. Yeah. Um, but this is the, the standard bio paperwork. They did come into town hall and, note, and, and note, notarize it with Karen, I think, on Friday. Uh, we didn't actually do the notary. I need you folks to yeah. approve, it. approve it and sign it. Backdate it and then I'll notarize it. I witnessed their signatures. So we have, we have, um, at least in one page in the documents, we have under grantee name, we have, we need a majority of the select board. So uh, I believe just, uh, I believe just one place. So we can just pass that around if the select board agrees on this buyout. Um, I personally would like to see. <coughs> A couple other houses in Union and these two houses on Main Street. Why? Um, well, there's that strip of four, right, on Union? Yeah. The the duplex, this one, thirty eight, and then the um, the one we just approved. Yeah, and then the other property that applied thirty six Union. Um, you approved the paperwork. She's got us. She's the owner is in Florida. She's got to sign and get it notarized, and that's going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping we won't have undue delays there. 
but I think it's in the interest of people to apply now okay. since there's state funding to pay our 25% normal 25% share. I was going to say, do you have any comments that differ from the previous with regards to? Not. Um, are we, are we going to see a lot more buyout requests or um, I had thought we would have seen four or five. I think the two properties right here on, on Maine would have applied and they, they have not. Okay. Um, there are the like, I wonder if people are under the misguided notion that it has to be their, their residence, but that's not the case for buyouts. Mm -hmm. right. um, the one right there at the end on Main Street is abandoned at this point, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anyone there myself. Yeah. I'm not sure it's abandoned. I don't know exactly what the case is, but it's also low and it's been flooded twice now in six months. So it would appear to me that a buyout is not the worst thing to consider. Right. Um, Were we able to reach him? No. Oh. I'm not able to reach. I've tried to reach you on our no up there. Um, it's certainly not tenant occupied or owner occupied. Um, I don't know that it's abandoned, but I haven't seen anyone in there since I've been here. So um, it's a good candidate, but we can't force them to do it. Right. Karen, do you know what the tax bill is on that by any chance? So, so this, this from 36 Junior are both in the grand list around 150, 160 grand. So pretty minimal impact on the grand list. And the ones across the street are similarly low, very low. So Tom, please. Uh, these monies from FEMA, do they also include the monies from Google? Yes. Yeah. So if if the owner signs off, the town signs off, it's really a first step. FEMA has to go through their whole process. FEMA gives the owner an appraisal value for the property, and that's based on the pre flood value, and the owner can accept or reject. Once they accept, the real process starts, and, and FEMA, through state emergency management, really, who does the work and administers it. But Property is leveled. Um, title is turned over to the town. Uh, we can we can uh, let it grow. We can we can have um, we can have a park. What we can't do is put impervious surface. So if we make a parking ride, we can't gravel it. Um, we can put a playground, and that's really it. Um, we cannot legally just say to the neighbor, "Hey, you want a bigger yard? We'll sell you the lot for a buck." Um, there's pretty substantial deed restrictions on the properties. Grow marijuana and it's can't grow. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially green yes, space. Grow. <laughs> you know, wouldn't wouldn't be a bad thing to put a pocket park necessarily. That's Rogers would now in the pocket park if it's going down one week. So it's it's free to us because our normal 25% buyout share would be paid by the state, but the long-term maintenance is is our challenge. But we don't have to maintain it necessarily. Were you asking me the value of the last one right here, 35? Yeah. 72,800. Say 72? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the granular value. So the, the pre flood appraisal might be better. Mm -hmm. And 36 Union is on the market. Mm -hmm. um, I think at 135. Yeah. So if this flooding continues to happen, what's going to happen with our grand list? I mean, it's going to get. Why? That's that's the challenge. Um, we know the the few houses that have applied. It's pretty small. It's you know three hundred grand if they were both approved, and 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 even then the buyout's not going to happen for you know, another tax year. Um, not a huge challenge, I don't think, because even if this extra flood gets a number of other people to apply, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like if you own the house now, you know that you know the history of Irene. You've been through this flood. Um, maybe this one's not all that likely to change your mind. I'm maybe. talking about real real estate values in the village in the peasant whole. Not yeah. just like all oh, random. Yeah, so that's that's street. something our listeners have spent some time on. Um, after Irene, what they did was they they did uh, they they applied you know essentially a deflation factor to all the property that was. I forget if it was in the floodplain or impacted by the flood, but they but they lowered it. Um, and they, they 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 moved it up slowly over the years, but they determined after after not that long a period that the the real estate market ignored Irene, and so they they said, well, houses are selling, and there's no difference in market prices in the flood zone versus without. You don't get a grand list discount. Right. So they're they're talking about that now, and any action would take place for next year's grand list, but they're not thinking it's a massive discount in part because. 
They don't have any data, um, at least as yet. Um, and it, it, it's a long-term issue, and there's there's so much demand for housing right now um, that it's, it's going to be a little hard to sort of allow. I think they're reluctant to say, hey, we're just going to lower your granulous values for this whole neighborhood by X factor without having a good logical, you know, you know, basis for that. Um, so they're going to take their time there. Well, there are two buildings out on the internet, down on South Main Street, almost across from the southern exit of the, of the state complex that have been the real estate side they've been there for, you know, effectively longer than I would have anticipated yeah. being there. And I'm wondering if they're sort of scratching their heads going, do I want to pay the emergency building in the spirit of what damage areas or are they just asking for that for? One of the ones you're referring to was in a bankruptcy proceeding. No, I think you're talking about materials, aren't you? Matera Maples on the corner of Batchelder. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I could only speculate why those are still on the market and I don't think it's appropriate today. Um, and last note is I would just say, I think it's also a statewide issue. Like so much of we've talked about, but this file in Grand List, I will just say there's communities beyond Waterbury wrestling with it. And I don't know if it's a state solution or whatnot. Um, we have a motion on this 40 Union Street buyout request. Um. Yeah. I move to approve the formal buyout for 40 Union Street. Sally, J. Ashton, and Jack O. How do you pronounce that last name? X. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Please, hello. Please, hello. Please, hello. Please, hello. Please, hello. I'm not breaking them all. I'm going to leave them just lay out of one. Yeah. Oh, she oh. needs a second. <laughs> and they both. One for my one. Perfect. Kane made a motion. Second. <laughs> awesome. Um, any further discussion? All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. By it passing, was the people request Yes. Yes. So um, I'll pass this one around. It looks like it needs. One, two signatures. Maybe Tom can witness and I will motorize. So if that great. Well, yep. we have made our. Yep. So I'd say next meeting agenda, which Karen was kind enough to prepare for. Um, um, what? Um, Grantees, this one? Yeah, I guess so, right? They were grand tour. So you're so your grand grantees. Yes. Yes. Um, next meeting agenda. First question, just to say, is this, is a scheduled meeting for Thursday, January fourth? Do we anticipate the need for special meetings to our you know, fear of avoiding other computers that are not publicly noticed? Um, do you think it's worth scheduling a meeting virtually or otherwise for tomorrow or some other time prior to January fourth? Um, you know, we've been texting during the meeting. We are January fifth. We are certainly pressed on the other. <laughs> Yeah, actually, Mike and then Alyssa can witness, and then right. three of you will assign. Make sure you so date it on the eighth, please. Oh, no, I dated it for the eighth. Okay. The last reading, the reading on the river when I checked it a half hour and forty minutes ago was four twenty four point three nine. It's still going up. Huh? No, it's now four twenty four point three two. Oh, it's going down. So it, I mean, it's it's a hundred, right? Or a few hundred. So I'm not even sure. It's sure. going anywhere. <laughs> right there. Uh, Bill, Bill Woodruff texted me and he said it looks like it looks like in the neighborhoods we're starting to see things go down, which would tell me that the catch basins are probably moving moving a little bit in the right direction. Um, I feel pretty confident in saying we can't. Um, we're just acknowledging. Well, I'll like just watch on the news. I'm not sleep. All right, and I'm just acknowledging for wrap up and debrief. I guess just in the spirit of, I will say, like, candidly, you all witnessed it. We were just in some emergency meetings and I saw half the room discussing it. And I don't think there's any priority that were for legitimate emergency and, yeah. reasons. I'm just saying, in the spirit of, we are in a public meeting now. Is it better to have one and cancel it than the other way around? Um, for a meeting for more? Yeah, I'm just in the spirit of, is it better to put something on the calendar and cancel it if we determine it's unnecessary? Um, I think I think that's a good idea to put a meeting on the books for tomorrow. In, in the event that while we're asleep, 
waters rise, you know? Right, or even, to, I mean, I don't know what you're saying. Or, I'm not trying to impose, but like, if you know, the three of us can make it, I mean, Danny's online, should we just schedule an emergency meeting for 10 a.m. that could adjourn yeah. after 15 minutes or be canceled? If, sure. if sure. not, I just 10 a.m. Is, 10 a.m. Yeah. is that better? Oh, um, so, I think we can just oh, say 10 a.m. Yeah. and Karen will be going out of the website. No. <laughs> no. just have no. one no. item, blood response. And worst case, we can cancel. Oh. And I, if you're putting on Facebook, I would just say that. Yeah. You know, not due to stress. <laughs> How do I say that too? And I'm saying just. What, what's an honorable for Tim? I just said Tim arbitrarily. I'm open to the consensus of the group. Yeah. Yeah. Liz has not texted. I have a speak with the temple. <laughs> I was saying, I just got a text. I could say after this. Um, uh, and then we can discuss the actual January. Then we give you something. Like yeah, that. I have one thing before we adjourn. I don't think it's kind of out of place. It's just more of an acknowledgement. Let's um, do agenda first, then. If that's okay. okay. I've got one more agenda. So we're do we're gonna proceed as though we're having our a special emergency meeting tomorrow at ten a.m. Yep. If okay. nothing else to touch base, and then can adjourn. Karen then was kind enough to provide a draft agenda for Thursday, January fourth, um, with public budget. Penalty tax rate, which I assume we need to do by that date, rec committee update. Um, I'm just saying out loud that we should still get the UFA tonight. I'm not saying that I think January 4th is the next best time for it, but we should reschedule him at some point. So the, the penalty tax rate, I'm not sure we need to discuss it at all. We we put it in there as a bit of a placeholder. So the penalty was set by the voters at 8%. It's been that way. Forever and a day. Mm -hmm. Every year, some people pay a day or two late, and they say, it's a, you know, yeah. "Hey, my, it's eight percent on a lot of on a big basis, and it's a lot of money." And and I say, "Well, guess what? I can't waive that for you because the voters approved it, and and I've essentially been committing fraud. I right? can't can't go against the will of the voters." Um, and so I say, "Well, you can come to the select board. You can you can you can file you can file." You go through the process, you get your money back. You, the board the board of um, you can do that, but I but I say to them, I don't think you meet the legal criteria for the payment. And I send them the statute. And I say, you can go to town meeting day and say, I think 8% is too high. And, and what I also say is to them openly is that most of what we're doing is not just collecting our taxes, but the school taxes, which is four times ours. And so yeah. if there's no penalty or interest, I'm gonna have a cash flow problem and that's gonna to cost to you in the end in some way, shape or form anyway. Right. So it comes up every year around penalty time. Yeah. I'm not sure we need to talk about it, um, but we certainly can. If there's a desire. Uh, it's a big penalty. I think you'll probably struggle to find a town that doesn't, and it's a statutory maximum, you'll probably struggle to find a town that charges less than eight. So to clear, this would be for you first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of the I don't know if that's what we're that for the It's more just a general conversation. Okay. And I will just say, I know like, Chris Young, who was here, made a big thing about it at town meeting because that was, had come up yeah. in the past that you like wanted to talk recently, so. And Chris was, Chris made a big deal of it because I think he was sick of hearing right. people Right. Board of I'm abatement sad. hearings, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're leaving it on then? Okay. Um, so are we putting skip students on there? I I guess that's an open question. That's a question for skip. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think probably for now it's safe. Sorry, I think well, this... we have to do like keep you know we should have a keep Wallace nominee. Right, so this is getting right for it. Yeah, so you know, sooner in the okay, so we, we could maybe you can get in this way if you need to, guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, of course. Willing to reach out to Skip and just ask if there's any item. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will get hold of Skip when the time is right and ask him. You have agendas on the fourth, the eighth, the twenty second, and the 29th. So there's plenty of time for me to put him where it, it suits Perfect. him best. I'm happy to be the point person for that. Um, we'll and to reschedule the abatement. Yeah, I've, I've already started that process. Yeah, thanks. I've I've thrown an email to Liz, Bob Butler, and Alec Tuscany, Mary Woodruff. I need the select board and at least two listers to make my quorum. So I will make plans to do that 
on a night when we're already having a select board meeting. That's easy as for you guys, easy as for me, frankly. Um, you mentioned uh, a, just a short time ago a schedule that you provided. A couple meetings ago, I presented a budget schedule. So we have budget as an agenda. So it's okay. more just who shows up and presents and what do we okay. talk about in detail. Okay. So do you, you think I'll, I looked for it in the last meeting? I didn't see it. You think it's back a little ways? Maybe I just didn't yeah, go back far enough. Days. Okay. I'll, I've got, okay. I can email it. Because that'll be helpful for me. I can start plugging those yeah, things. It's a matter in. of what departments we go through. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, so I will do the, the uh, outreach to skip if you're all, Perfect. if you're all okay with that and see when we can. Same I guess I would say budget in conversation with Tom and Roger when he's back on the schedule around what specific yeah. items that we review that night. And it's probably time to add to the parking lot at least um, our development bylaws. The PC has now set dates for their public hearings, and when they have two public hearings, they will then send to you the bylaws. So I can circulate around um, the link to the draft bylaws. Um, Please do. I think Bill told me April 8th. I already have it on our... It may be on our calendar already. Um, I know we have a day. I don't know it offhand. That sounds about right. Um, but it's a pretty extensive document. So I'll, I'll talk with staff and, and the PC a bit about how, you know, they've been working on it for years, how, how you all digest it in a reasonable format in the next several months. Which just speaking more of the South, I'm say going to the planning commission here because they are able to make changes there before it gets to us, which is just to say, like, ideally in my world, it doesn't arrive at the select board and we say, hey, by the way, we have a ton of problems with what you have drafted. So aren't, aren't they meeting on the same nights that we're meeting? Yeah, they they meeting have been, I don't know on the are they hearings. I don't know the dates offhand they're on my I just got them prior okay. to I'm just saying to me that would be worth circulating and maybe we need to adjust our meetings because I just think like we should it was it's a useful way to be able to provide that. Anyway, that. sorry. I thought I knew, but maybe I was wrong. I Neil also came... wanted to ask about the interim bylaws because they were trying to back it up so oh. that they could get to us oh, maybe by that's... April eighth. And maybe that's what like, it was. It was 30 days. Do we need to maybe that's what it was because uh, they expire and the goal is that these will replace them. Um, which would have made you do calendar math. Yeah, he, he definitely, <laughs> excuse me, Neil definitely came to me with some dates, and, and I apologize that maybe it wasn't April 8th. I don't know where that date came from, but. Um, great. So, yes, bylaws in the parking lot. And I would say it sounds like these agenda items plus <laughs> government. Um, and I would need to get a flood update for this flood since we have a lot of them now. Um, but otherwise, looks good, and we'll defer to you and Roger around order and scheduling. The hell was that? Okay. Yeah. 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 Like train. Go back, go back there. Oh. Mm -hmm. Sound like a train. All right, we have a play poker meeting at 10 a.m. tomorrow. We have Karen, other questions or things you need on this agenda? Oh, it's I, the fire department. I don't think so. I'm adding flood update to the fourth. Um, I'm adding development bylaws to the parking lot, and um, I think the recreation committee update. I mean, Roger and Tom and I all, always meet on Fridays and tweak the time slots and things of that nature. So we'll figure out how long that discussion is going to take. I do think that's already been confirmed for the fourth recreation committee update. My recollection is that that was a discussion that we had, um, and so and I'll just. Perfect. I think mostly just get skip rescheduled. Thank skip, you much. Skip for the record was just tickled pink that he was asked by the select board. Oh, to come um, in. Yeah. Yeah. Last words, Mike, and then we'll get out of here. If I had a senior moment, I probably should have done this in the in the public section. But this is just to acknowledge that the uh friends of the Waterbury Reservoir were the recipients of the um uh, Zedestrom Award by Green Mountain Power, which is like the premier environmental award in the state of Vermont. Oh. So kudos to the friends of the Waterbury for all the stuff that the greeter program, the loon work that they've done, the fishing recycles, recycling stuff that they've done. The fishing work they've done up there. It's yeah, not fishing, it's more just Get trash away, which is the receptacles great. for yeah, uh, fishing yeah. line. It's great, but I think it, you know they deserve a big kudos. I know Lisa's already put that in the um in in, in, the, in the roundabout, 
And but I just think for the record, uh, a, a big acknowledgement for their accomplishments. Thank you so much. Any other business? So I'm going to take a I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, please add. Aye. Yes. All right. We are adjourned at 9.39 p.m. Thank you all. Did we get our time?